morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and call to order the meeting of the Placer County Board of Supervisors for Tuesday, April 7th, 2015. We begin this morning with a flag salute led by David Bosch. Thank you. And now Ann will read the statement of meeting procedures. Welcome to the Placer County Board of Supervisors meeting of Tuesday, April 7th, 2015. Agendas are available on the wall outside this meeting room. If you are here to speak on an issue not appearing on the agenda, you may do so during the public comment period. There is a three minute time limit per speaker. The board is not permitted to take action on items addressed under public comment. When you speak, clearly state your name and address for the record. All items on the agenda will be open for the public to address before final action is taken. There is a three minute time limit per speaker, which will be monitored by a timer on the podium. If there is a person speaking on behalf of a group with no other testimony from another member of the group, please identify yourself as such and your time may be extended at the pleasure of the board. Keep in mind that the chairman has the discretion of limiting the total discussion time on any item. If you are hearing impaired, we have listening devices available. It is requested that all cell phones be turned off or put in the silent mode. Thank you for your participation and cooperation. Thank you, Ann. So we will continue with our consent agenda. Any board member have any item on consent they wish removed for discussion? Seeing no lights up here. Any member of the public have any item on the consent calendar that they've identified that they would like the board to remove for discussion? Seeing none, we'll bring it back for motion. The motion Holmes and second Duran. Roll call, please. Holmes, yes. Duran, Mike yes. Ant, yes. Montgomery, yes. Euler. Aye. All right, that moves us to public comment. This is the time when, as Ann indicated earlier, members of the public can address the board on any item not on the agenda. Uh, if you're here to speak about an item that is agendized today, please wait until that item comes up. Please understand the board cannot take action on any item. Whoa, hello. The board cannot take action. Got that God re reverb thing going there. On any item uh, raised uh, under public comment, and please identify yourself and try to keep your comments to three minutes. Good morning. Husky, and I am a resident of Placer County. I'm here to uh, speak to the DeWitt property situation. Um, I am representing the Save DeWitt Legacy Group. We are yet again asking the Board of Supervisors to halt the demolition of all buildings on the DeWitt property until there is actually a plan and actually some approvals and something to go on instead of just uh, scraping all these buildings. Uh, the buildings have historical value. Uh, they include the senior center, which provides a whole host of uh, opportunities for seniors to socialize. Uh, there used to be a lot more services there, but those have gone to some degree. There is the DeWitt Theater, as you well know, which is a permanent building that was built during World War II, and it serves as an educational uh, platform for uh, theater arts and music and dance, etc. So these are all great services to the community. Right now, the Senior Center and the theater have been told they have to vacate by June. I don't see the rationale in this since there isn't any plan yet. Um, I also wanted to point out that just recently I learned that I'm sure you, some of you or all of you are familiar with the artist uh, Martin Ramirez who actually was in the mental hospital at DeWitt. Uh, the United States Post Office is producing a set of commemorative stamps of his artwork. The Board of Supervisors is scraping the building. 
there's, you know, I just think that this has to be thought through more. Um, I think that Board of Supervisors, we'd like to see them slow down and take a deep breath because this property belongs to the people of Placer County and we need to have our input on the plan and there are so many possibilities for that property. It is a precious piece of land and it should be used to provide services and things to the people of Placer County. Uh, Jim Holmes at a meeting about a month ago said that he was interested in a community center and a theater. Well, you got it there already. You just have to add to it and upgrade it. And, you know, we can all explore this together. I have been looking into some of the costs of the Costco project, and to date I have identified a million dollars that has already been spent. These are figures that have come from the county. And I also have an estimate, a rough estimate, that demolition will be 1.5 to $2 million. You know, and while that's a lot of money, yeah, you know, we're talking about three and a half million dollars here, and we're closing libraries, we're closing senior centers, we're closing, you know, theaters. These are the things that serve the soul of the people in your community. You know, uh, we don't have to provide, you know, we don't have to go and help the Costco's of the world and the Conkeys of the world. What we need to do is provide the services and take care of the people in this community. So I look for different action from the Board of Supervisors, as does my group. Thank you. Thank you. Morning, Mr. Chair and members of the Board of Supervisors. I'm Kevin Hanley, CEO of the Auburn Chamber of Commerce and the Board of Directors. Board of Directors of the Chamber uh, issued the following policy statement regarding use of the surplus lands of the Placer County Government Center. We believe that a good relationship between the City of Auburn and Placer County is indispensable for improving the quality of life for all the Auburn area residents and we, we believe there's a good opportunity for the county and the city and the residents to work together for the long-term good of Auburn and the North Auburn area. Uh, Auburn area residents want uh, more community from their local governments and that can be defined as quality of life or if you look at the Sierra Business Council they define it as increasing the financial capital, social capital uh, and natural capital. But sometimes state law and the incentives that it gives creates a situation in which local governments, cities and counties are competing for sales tax dollars which can sometimes interfere with uh, what the community wants in a broader way. Uh, last month at a meeting I was attending a local uh, business owner who runs a, a bike shop mentioned to me and others that she was thinking of moving out of Auburn and going to Folsom because Folsom, they have more residents with disposable income and they, they like the higher price bicycles and so forth. And, and that was an important discussion because what it says is that we need more high wage jobs in Auburn and the North Auburn area if we're gonna keep our shops open in Auburn and North Auburn. According to uh, Professor Enrico Moretti, he's a professor at uh, UC Berkeley and he recently wrote a, book, a book, The New Geography of Jobs. He says that high-tech jobs uh, create five additional jobs uh, out of the high-tech sector. So that's a five to one multiplier effect. And that's powerful. Um, we think there's a better solution for the surplus lands at the, at the county center. We recommend that the city of Auburn and Placer County work together and create a task force that will hire experts, conduct studies, and create a master plan for North Auburn Innovation and High Wage Job Center on those lands. And the goal of this center would be to attract private sector incubators, high-tech, um, science-based jobs, startups, 
to attract young entrepreneurs to the Auburn area. And this is compatible with the C2 and D uh, compatibility zones in the Auburn Municipal Airport, so higher education and training can occur. I just want to conclude, since my time is up, that uh, I did send you a more extensive letter uh, to all the board, board members about this idea. I think it's a great opportunity for the county and the city to come together, create high wage jobs, create uh, higher education opportunities, and this will increase uh, the social, the natural, and financial wealth of the Auburn area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hanley. Anyone else? Ramona Brockman, 4060 Ridge Drive, Loomis, California. I also wanted to comment on the DeWitt Center uh, issue because I find it very strange uh, that there was a finding of no historical significance to a World War II era theater built by the U.S. military for a hospital complex. I find it very strange that that would carry no historical significance. That era of our history is extremely important, not only for the overseas battles that were fought, but also for how it changed our lives and culture here in the United States. So I would question that, and I would also uh, really like to find out what the State Historic Preservation ha Officer would have to say about that uh, finding of no si historical significance. After all, there are significant things to preserve of our history during that era. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to address the board uh, under public comment? Yes, sir. Board, mem sorry. Board members, my name is Jim Miller, and this is my daughter, Caitlin. We are members of the U.S. Track and Field Club, uh, Res sorry, uh, Re Revolution Express, it, based out of Rockland, California. My daughter would like to present you uh, some information. Um, we are the, uh, we would like to invite you to our next track meet at April 25th, 7 to 2 p.m. at Rockland High School, um, Victoria Lane in Rockland, California. We are a part of the Pacific Association of, of Track and Field, which is a large from track and field to um, ultra racing, which is the Western 100, the American River 50, um, cross country, and it goes from basically age, sub bantam is I think five, and goes all the way up to 105 um, in age. I just saw the man that just set the world record for the 102 to 105 in the 400 meter a couple weeks ago. It's pretty impressive. We also are hosting the Pacific Association Youth Championship um, at Whitney High School, which is in May 30th and 31st. And the Pacific Association is basically from uh, San Luis Obispo, um, cut across Merced, Turlock, all of Northern California and Northern Nevada. So those people are coming into our, our backyard and we get to showcase them um, who we are and what we are and why we are and why we're such a great place to live, work, breathe, and be educated. And that's pretty much it. Um, we just thank you for your time. Thank you. And um, if you have any questions? Thank you for being here this morning and for informing us about this. What's your favorite event? Um. I want to be a pole vaulter, and my favorite event is discus. Is what? Discus. Discus. You have good upper body strength? Yeah. Arm wrestle dad? You take him two out of three? Mm. Yeah? I, I, I do have to say that last night at practice, you got to spend some time with um, Coach Nick, who is one of Stacy Dragila's coaches from oh. back in the day, who had to kind of... Yeah. You know, yeah, gold medalist, not too shabby, former world record holder. Oh, right out of Auburn. That's right. So. That's great. Placer grad. Uh, Placer grad, by the way. 
Uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, uh, we didn't get your name. Sweetie. Oh, um, Caitlin Miller. Caitlin. Caitlin. Okay, yeah. thank you. And I just, uh, just to see some folks from the Sheriff's Department here. Our uh, Sheriff, uh, you know, his specialty was the 400, and I think he'd qualify for the in excess of 100 year old uh, <laughs> competitors. I will remind him of that. <laughs> thank you very much for being here this morning. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anybody want to try to follow that? <laughs> okay, we're going to go ahead and move on with a couple of proclamations that we have. Uh, I'm sorry, you did. Please come on up. Hello. Hi. My name is Marva, and I am very active in defending the library system. Okay, if you're, let me just interrupt you real quick. If you're here to talk about the library, that is an agendized and we item. wait? Yeah, the, you'll but get plenty of opportunity. This is about the carpeting. About the what? Carpeting at the public library, not the law library. We have salvaged the law library, but now we need to hold off in the Beecher Room um, because it is prohibiting silver screen on May the 2nd, and the carpeting looks real good actually and there's only one thing to move and that's the piano and it's not books and maybe they were thinking of moving some of the books and removing the carpeting in the rest of the library but there is a way that they can hold off since the first Saturday of every month at 1, 4 and 7.30 this is a service that's provided to people that cannot go to places like Auburn Stadium 10 to pay seven or eight dollars for a movie and this has gone on for 17 or 18 years and I am asking for the consideration of the people that attend the movies very faithfully the first Saturday of every month these are old movies and uh, it's a special thing for a lot of us and we didn't know until this past Saturday that silver screen was going dark this is all over the carpeting which looks very good in the Beecher room but if there is a way they could hold off until the following Monday because the board is supposed to approve the carpeting of the public library and the fact is that that's just a little tiny room that provides a great service for people that cannot afford a regular theater and it's gone on for so long I don't think silver screen has ever been dark I may not be correct about this because I've been attending for about two years and I never miss a Saturday and I'm asking for that consideration because the library is supposed to start closing April 30th. I don't have my documents because everything's so wet this morning, but I did read it and Mary George's uh, name as director is on it and I know they're going to um, deal with the closure of Loomis and Meta Vista, which is a shame because we need our library systems regardless of where they are and especially the Placer County Sparks Law Library. And I'm here because of the movies, and um, I attended a little meeting last night, and someone said it's a done deal. I don't think so. I think we should have the consideration for May the 2nd, or Wizard of Oz, which is a very important movie through the years. Otherwise, and this is a schedule that was planned months ago by um, Susan Rushton, who has dealt with several screen for some 17 or 18 years. And I'm assuming Susan is here someplace, but I'm speaking for myself and the other people that attend this. So I think my three minutes are up. Thank you. And I haven't done well, this. Supervisor a Montgomery has a, a yeah. thought or two on this. Yeah, Chairman Mueller, um, I actually see Susan Rushton in the room, and I would just suggest that she get together with Mary George offline and see what accommodations you guys can come to. Um, there's a a, a wide range of times that the yes, library flexible. could potentially be closed, there may be no impact at all on the silver screen. So if, if I could ask the two of you just to get together. It's just that one Saturday. You know, otherwise, you. We, we don't get to see this one particular movie that's been around for years that's so popular. Okay. And thank that's you. what we were told last Saturday. And I thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anybody else wish to address the board under public comment? You've already. I'm sorry? This is a different subject. Okay. If you would. would like to. Uh, let you know that Auburn Recreation District has uh, will be having the dedication of six new pickleball courts up in Regional Park on Friday, which is a huge service to seniors, but also to
people of all ages. My kids, my grandkids play pickleball. So I would like to invite all of you to come out for a game of pickleball sometime. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else have anything they would like to address under public comments? All right, seeing none, we will go ahead and move on. We have two proclamations. Oh, thank you. It's hard to Skip see right over supervisor committee reports. Any member of the board have anything they wish to report out under supervisor committee reports? Seeing no lights, now we will move on to our proclamations. Uh, the first is in recognition of the big day of giving. I'd like to ask if Veronica Blake, and you're the chair, aren't you, Mr. Williams? No, you're not the chair, but you're here anyway? All right, you, you, you drew the short straw. You had to come this morning. Veronica, come on up if you would, please. As I find the right proclamation here, when did you rotate it? Weren't you chair last year? I am on the uh, board of directors, and um, Veronica always likes to get me up early in the morning. Right, yeah. Well, that's because you're, you're one that actually knows where this building is. <laughs> Uh, so this is uh, a, a recognition, a proclamation of the matter proclaiming um, May 5th is a big day of giving in Placer County. And I will read the resolution and then present it. Whereas community foundations encourage giving back in their communities with a Give Local America event in which communities across the United States are participating on May 5th, 2015. And the Placer Community Foundation, a trusted resource for giving back in Placer County, will host the big day of giving on May 5th in partnership with GiveLocalNow.org and regional community foundations so that hundreds of people can make gifts that support vital causes in their own communities. And every local gift made on the big day of giving will be amplified with incentives and prize dollars, <laughs> allowing each gift to, further, uh, to go further and empowering our local nonprofits to do more and 500 nonprofits throughout the region will be participating in the Big Day of Giving, 100 of which reside here in Placer County and serve our residents. The Big Day of Giving offers an opportunity for all residents to give within their means to support the good work of our local nonprofits and raise the level of philanthropy in Placer County. Philanthropic investments in our local nonprofits is an investment in the common good because when our nonprofits work toward improving our quality of life, including better conditions and possibilities for underserved individuals and families, our community as a whole prospers. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Placer County Board of Supervisors does hereby proclaim May 5th, 2015, the big day of giving and encourages everyone to give local and support your county. And with that, Veronica, would you please say a word or two about last year's big day of giving? If I recall correctly, last year was the first year that we participated as a region, and we broke all kinds of records. Didn't we set some kind of expectation? You have that information, Jim? Jim's got it. Uh, Jim's got it. I almost can throw all my notes away now after you read that proclamation. <laughs> but um, first of all, thank you very much to the board for this this proclamation. Um, as I said, I, I am uh, on the board of directors, have the honor of working with Veronica on a number of the issues. The community foundation is dedicated to growing philanthropy in the county. Um, and this year we are actually thrilled that it's over 100. We're showcasing 112 Placer County nonprofits on May 5th. That's great. And this represents about 20% of the 533 groups that will be um, participating in the four county regional event um, as you as you noted the community foundation has raised funds to offer prize challenges to the placer nonprofits and a pool of incentive funds has been raised within the region as a whole so this means that anyone who donates twenty five dollars or more on may 5th is leveraging their gift even further all gifts go directly to the nonprofits selected at bigdayofgiving.org. As you know, this is a virtual giving event. That means online, Supervisor Wygant. So, um, <laughs> he made some illusion about our sheriff's age earlier, and, and I might have reason to not feel good about that. Um, um, but we still want to showcase the nonprofits here in Placer County, so we're holding two events. Um, the first is a kickoff event at Westfield Galleria in Roseville 
on May 5th between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. where people can learn about the different nonprofits and the services they provide to our community. Uh, there, are, there will be entertainment and actual prizes to people who donate right then and there as well. So there's a good incentive for you to get out. And there will also be an Auburn Fiesta in the evening at the State Theater in Auburn from 4.30 to 7 p.m. It's co-sponsored by the Young Professionals Group, The Ripple Effect, and I think we have some people here from there. Um, and it features local nonprofits, a photo booth, entertainment and refreshments. So we encourage all of you to attend one of these events and show your support. Um, you may or you may not recall, but last year's big day of giving raised $500,000 for nonprofits in Placer County, and it brought awareness and visibility to our local nonprofits. It would har be hard to find a nonprofit in Placer County that isn't addressing some cause, whether it's arts, education, open space, health and human services, animal welfare, etc., that are deeply important to individuals and families in our community. Chances are good these groups are participating in the big day of giving. In, in fact, I believe um, Placer Land Trust is represented here today, and last year they earned the largest amount of donations in Placer County, and they were second place in the entire region. So it's a pretty impressive accomplishment, and it shows what we in Placer County can do when we put our minds to it. Our nonprofits are deserving of our support, and we sincerely appreciate your help in encouraging people to give where their heart is on May 5th. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments for either Supervisor Williams or Veronica? Ms. Montgomery? I uh, just wanted to mention we will be in a Board of Supervisors meeting that morning, but I've RSVP'd for the State Theater event, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, I, I won't mention it by name, and I'll probably get yelled at that. For, for not doing it, but as the president of one of the local nonprofits, um, the big the big day of giving is a wonderful event. Um, it helps educate people about the variety of nonprofits in Placer County, um, and frankly gives folks a, a targeted opportunity uh, to donate. That sometimes incentivizes people who otherwise may say, "Oh, I'll do it another time." Cinco de Mayo, May fifth, big day of giving. <laughs> It's a wonderful event. Support your local nonprofit, whatever it is you choose to support. I'm sure there'll be a ton of library donations coming in uh, based on the crowd here today. But I just think it's a wonderful opportunity. And I really want to thank um, you guys for taking this on because I know it was an enormous amount of work last year. <laughs> Uh, that, that's an understatement. Uh, yeah, I, I, I saw Veronica, I think, that evening, and she looked um, exhausted but um, happy. Uh, and I just really do want to say thank you because none of us at the local nonprofit level would be able to do it without the Placer Community Foundation taking the lead on this. So thank you very much. So just for clarification, if somebody wants to find uh, all of the different nonprofits that are registered to participate in the Big Day of Giving, then go to givelocalnow.org. And if, for instance, the Auburn Symphony might happen to be <laughs> registered and somebody wanted to give to the Auburn Symphony, um, they might be able to do that there and, and, and choose from amongst others. Absolutely. Like okay. the Symphony. Like the Auburn Symphony. Yeah. <laughs> can, can we take a quick picture? Yeah. We're, yeah. Okay. Now you guys all go in the front. Even because my sister. Is more to this than I a little. Um, no, no. Um, go ahead. I'm no, just his no. brother. <laughs> 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 That's not funny about giving support. No. <laughs> I'll just stand behind Susie. That way you can see me. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank, thank you, members of the board, very much. And speaking of one of our very worthy nonprofits that is deserving of your consideration of donations on May 5th, uh, I'd like to ask if Barbara Bassana and Peggy Jett would come forward. 
as I read this proclamation declaring April 2015th as Child Abuse Prevention and Awareness Month in Placer County. Whereas all adults and caregivers have a responsibility as neighbors, community members, and citizens of Placer County to help create healthy, safe, and nurturing experiences for children and youth. And a safe and healthy childhood helps create confident, successful, and independent adults. And child abuse and neglect often occurs when people find themselves in isolated or stressful situations without community resources and don't know how to cope. And the majority of child abuse cases stem from situations and conditions that are preventable when our communities are supportive, active, and engaged. And child abuse and neglect can be reduced by making sure every family has the support it needs and deserves to raise their children in a healthy environment. And effective prevention programs succeed because the partnerships amongst agencies, schools, religious organizations, law enforcement agencies, and the business community and Placer County's collab collaborative uh, and Placer County's collaborative is among the most effective in the country and for 26 years Kids First a child abuse prevention agency comprised of two family resources centers located in Roseville and Auburn has served the Sierra Sacramento region as a child abuse prevention council and whereas a blue ribbon or displaying a pinwheel in April will serve as a positive reminder that together we can prevent child abuse and keep children safe. Now therefore be it proclaimed that Placer County Board of Supervisors does hereby proclaim April 2015th as Child Abuse Prevention Awareness Month and urges all citizens to join Kids First and its engaged partners as they support each family's efforts to keep themselves and their children safe, happy, and healthy. Any comments before I come down and present this? Great. Thank you very much. One of the things I wanted to just focus on is the collaborative nature of Placer County and our partnerships. I'm sorry, Barbara, we know you, but you oh, are? Barbara Bassana, Kids First uh, Executive Director, 124 Main Street, Roseville, California, and Peggy Jett, uh, our board chair. Uh, thank you. Um, and again, I wanted to focus on our collaborative nature here in Placer County because it is truly uh, we are thankful because of your support, the First Five Commission, Health and Human Services, the Placer County Law Enforcement and Criminal Justice Agencies, and our uh, nonprofit partners such as Lighthouse, CASA, Boys and Girls Club, Placer Community Foundation. The collaborative nature of our county is indeed um, something to behold and to be appreciative of, as well as our corporate partners. And so we want to celebrate and bring awareness, and your proclamation today will help us to do that. We have the pinwheels here. We were going to have a pinwheel garden. We're going to find a sunny day that we can do that. And as the sheriff, though, kicked it off on April 1st, and he challenged probation for a pinwheel garden, and we challenge all of you to display a pinwheel garden. We have lots of pinwheels. And um, when people ask you what that's about, it's because you support child abuse uh, prevention and awareness. And it's because of your efforts and the efforts of all of our collaborative partners in Placer County that we can strengthen children and families. So we want to thank you um, for your support. And together, we can prevent child abuse. Thank you. Ms. Jett, anything you want to add? And are there, go ahead. Uh, you know, I just want to express my thanks and gratitude also to the board because your, your support of Kids First is so fundamental to the work that we do. And your commitment to the care and well-being of this community is what makes Placer County such a wonderful place to live. Thank you. Thank you. And we do have um, pinwheels. We've got new pinwheel pins that each of you uh, should have at your place. Thank you. And um, we'll be displaying them not only then, but at our luncheon on April 16th. So you hope you can join us. And are there any other members of your board that might be uh, represented in the room here, past or present? Uh, probably past. Mr. Devin Bell over Devin there is Bell. one that I was thinking of. but. Yeah. He's still kind of current. We haven't quite let him go yet. <laughs> you go ahead and hold that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Expensive. <laughs> <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> Good 
Glad we fixed those mics and they're picking up everything now. <laughs> All right, we uh, proceed with our 9.30 timed item. This is a facility services item being presented by Bill Zimmerman in regard to uh, sewer maintenance operation fee increase for county service area 28, zone 55, the Lavodi area. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Euler, members of the board. Bill Zimmerman, Deputy Director of Facility Services. I brought Kathy Kane with me this morning. Kathy is here to verify any protest that we may receive as part of today's public hearing. Okay. So this morning we're asking your board to take a set of actions that will increase the monthly maintenance and operation fee that we charge our existing customers in the Lavodi Sewer CSA. And that is a direct pass through of increased costs that we pay to the Sacramento Regional County Sanitation District, which is also known as Regional SAN. The specific actions we have for you this morning are to conduct a public hearing to receive comments and consider protests regarding increasing the monthly MNO fee in County Service Area 28, Zone 55, which is the Lavodi Sewer CSA, from $38.64 per equivalent dwelling unit to $44.64, effective July 1, 2015 and then to $47.64 per EDU, effective July 1st of 2016. Our second request is that you adopt an ordinance amending section 13.12.350 of the Placer County Code, increasing the maintenance and operation fees in the Lavodi CSA. And then lastly, that you make a finding pursuant to section 21080 B8 of the Public Resource Code that the higher fees are derived from the cost of providing service and are exempt from environmental review. The Lavodi CSA is located along the Sacramento County line basically from Auburn Boulevard where it overcrosses Interstate 80 out to Sunrise Avenue, it has 238 equivalent dwelling units, and the wastewater that we collect is transported through Sacramento County and ultimately treated at Regional Sands Wastewater Treatment Plant, which is down by Laguna. We were notified about this time last year that Regional Sand was increasing their fees by $9 a month over a three-year period, so $3 in 2014, $3 in 2015, and then $3 in 2016. We didn't have time last year to go through the Proposition 218 process and have that initial $3 increase included in our 2014-2015 fees. And so our request for you this morning is for a $6 increase that will take effect on July 1st, 2015, and then an additional $3 increase that will take effect on July 1st of 2016. We have gone through the Proposition 218 process. We did send out notices to all of our customers letting them know about the increase and also how to go about filing a protest. Um, as of this morning, we have not received any protests. If we do receive protests as part of the public hearing, at the end of the hearing, we will give you an accurate count of those protests and let you know if we had a valid majority protest. So with that as an introduction, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have at this point in time or turn it back to you for the public hearing. Board members have any questions of staff? Supervisor Duran, your microphone, please. That one, when you say that you went through the Prop 218 uh, process, that's just the notice, or does that include the notice and the calculations of the fee? Uh, the timeline for the process is that we have to have this hearing 60 days before the rates take effect. 45 days prior to that, we have to send out individual notices to each of our customers. Um, in terms of calculating the fee, what we've done is it's a straight pass through. It's three dollars per EDU for each of those three years, and we've just passed that three dollars through. Okay, you've answered my question. Thank you. All right, seeing no other questions by board members, we will go ahead and open the public hearing for the purpose of receiving comments and protests uh, regarding the proposed fee increase in the Lavodi area. Is there anybody that wishes to address the board on this item? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing and bring this back to the board for two separate motions. First, I would entertain a motion to adopt the ordinance amending section 13.12.350 of the Placer County Code, increasing the maintenance and operation fee for Lavodi CSA uh, at no net county cost. Second. 
We have a motion Duran, second Holmes. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. aye opposed? None. Thank you. And the second motion, please, uh, to make a finding pursuant to section uh, 21080B8 of the Public Resource Code that the higher fees are derived directly from the cost of providing services and are therefore exempt from environmental review. Second. Motion Duran, second Holmes. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we will move on to our 940 timed item. This is Public Works, considering uh, no parking on Mears Drive. Good morning, Chairman, Good morning. members of the board. Stephanie Holloway with the Department of Public Works. I'd like to introduce you to Rebecca Salmon. She's our newest um, engineer in the Public Works Department. Um, today before you we have an item um, considering an urgency ordinance to establish no parking along Mears Drive. Mears Drive and Mears Place are the main access roadways into the Hidden Falls Regional Park. Uh, Mears Drive is a county maintained roadway with an additional CSA um, over that for maintenance obligations. Mears Place has been established as a um, permanent road division by your board. Um, the maintenance of that is funded by the homeowners of the adjacent Blue Oak Ranch subdivision. Due to recent increases um, of usage of the park, uh, the roadway has experienced numerous peak usage periods where we um, are having um, overflow parking along both of those roadways. Um, this overflow parking does um, restrict the existing 20-foot wide roadway um, in some instances and um, does provide concern of the local residents for um, emergency service. Um, the Public Works Department has established a number of signs that encourage um, patrons of the park to, pay, to park off the pavement, um, but residents do are remaining concerned about um, that the occurrence of that parking in wet as well as dry conditions um, into the summer months. Uh, a majority of the neighbors are in support of this no parking along the roadway, with the exception of one property owner, which has um, requested that parking along their property um, be, um, continue to be allowed. So, um, The urgency ordinance before you would establish no parking along both sides of the roadway, with the exception of that property um, along uh, Mears Drive, essentially from Mears Place to a point about 260 feet east. Um, of Mears Place along the south side of the roadway. Um, with that, Public Works recommends that you take action to conduct a, conduct a public hearing um, on the matter and recommends the adoption of the no parking ordinance along uh, Mears Drive with the supporting findings. The Parks Department is also here if you have any questions about park operations and I'd be happy to answer any Public Works questions. Thank you. Just for clarification, uh, contained on page eight of our agenda packet is exhibit one and this is meant to illustrate not only where the signs will be but also illustrate the area that was identified where parking will continue to be allowed correct Correct. thank okay. you thank you all right any board members have any questions before we conduct the public hearing seeing nothing from board members we will go ahead and open the public hearing uh, to accept comments regarding an urgency ordinance establishing parking restrictions on portions of Mirrors Drive. Anybody wish to address the board on this item? Sir, please come on forward. Good morning. My name is Myron Olson. I live on Mirrors Drive at 7707 Mirrors, which is kind of right on the corner of Mirrors Drive and Mirrors Place. Uh, and I guess one of the reasons why uh, we really need to have the no parking signs there is that there are ditches on both sides of this road. And uh, consequently, there is a large parcel of land just to the east of me that uh, has large tall grass along there. And we know that this is going to be a real high fire season uh, coming up. Uh, all we need to do is to have a car pull up onto that dry, dry grass with a catalytic, hot catalytic converter or muffler, and we are going to have a real bad fire. 
And so I think it's, it's most important that the supervisors take into consideration this no parking provision on that street. So just to be clear, sir, you are in support of the ordinance as proposed today? I am. Okay, thank yes, you. Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, one other thing I might just mention, and that is, is that up to this point, there have been a few of our neighbors that have decided to capitalize on the parking situation and turn their private properties into <laughs> public parking facilities uh, at a fee. And I don't blame them for wanting to do this. I just think it's an inappropriate use of the... Uh, of the private uh, property uh, that they have, as well as other owners in their area. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to address the board on this proposed parking restriction ordinance? All right, seeing none, we'll go ahead and bring it back to the board for action. Move approval. Okay, we have a motion, Wygan, second, Holmes. Uh, to approve the urgency ordinance establishing parking restrictions on portions of Mears Drive as illustrated in Exhibit 1, page 8 of our agenda packet. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Thank you very much. And we'll go ahead and move into our 945 timed item. This is the Homeless Needs Assessment and Action Plan. And I believe Mr. Brown is going to be leading this conversation this morning. Good morning, Chair Euler, members of the board, Jeff Brown, your Health and Human Services Director. Today I'm here with Dr. Robert Marbutt, our contracted homeless consultant, who will be presenting to you his findings and recommendations regarding the homeless needs assessment that he recently completed within our county. As a very uh, short bit of background, your board approved a contract with Dr. Marbutt last September to conduct a homeless needs assessment and make recommendations to strengthen our homeless continuum of care. The needs assessment involved meeting with over 70 stakeholders, which included yourselves, included elected and appointed city officials and safety net providers. It also included a survey of street level homeless individuals last November during an extreme weather event. The initial findings were shared with both the homeless advisory group and the general public at a forum in Auburn last February that was very successful was attended by over 150 individuals. So at this point, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Marbit to provide his detailed findings and recommendations. Thank you very much. And we've covered a lot of ground in the, the last four months, five months. Uh, here's a list of the activities that we've gone through, we've met with many, many uh, of the agencies and have met with all the agencies that directly are involved with homeless services, have met with a lot of folks that are experienced homelessness, have gone out with the observation, we've gone out with uh, four different law enforcement areas, uh, jurisdictional areas, and all of that was covered or, or in the contract and what we thought would be happening. We added uh, the second bullet from the bottom uh, as a survey instrument because there were some definite sort of holes in the data that we needed to get into. So we were able to go through and add that survey in, but everything was covered in the contract and then, then some. As we go through this, as, as a quick refresher, because this is going to become an important throughout the, the presentation, is to understand there are different triggers of homelessness. Not every uh, person experienced homeless experiences from the same trigger. In terms of the male side, you have folks that are have mental health issues, uh, which would include the veterans in, in post-traumatic stress, acute stress issue, and as well as folks that with substance abuse. And sometimes that is self-medicating with mental health. I mean, it, it, they're, they're, they, they come so together, and sadly, a lot of the treatment history in the United States is to separate those, but in reality, they're very connected, and 90 percent of homeless individuals are experienced one or the other or both, and generally are co-presenting on the male side. And then you also have a job retention. Not job, a lot of folks will get jobs, it's the retaining the job. And so I, I, it's not resume building, it's not job application, it's job retention and life skills necessary to keep that. On the female side, you need to add in domestic violence and, and divorce triggered, and that, that's very unique on, on the, uh, with the females in terms of the triggers. 
At first glance, when we got here, uh, there was a lot of anecdotal information. There was a lot of, uh, some of it was missed, some of it was, was, was turned out to be real. But we, we, we really wanted to get at the data. And so as we started going through, um, the one big observation, the overhang observation, is the agencies, there was no real system. Every agency was working as an independent silo. Uh, the next bit of information was the lack of information, the lack of data. A lot of, a lot of anecdotes, and because of the lack of real solid data, a lot of the myths were becoming facts. A lot of uh, decision making was being made with the lack of, of concrete uh, information. The few policies, and I'm using that policies in terms, were really tactical in nature and were being made by individuals. They weren't being made by the system or a collective or sort of a proactively thought out strategic uh, effort. The other is they're very, the, there are at least three major populations of homeless that are very distinct, Roseville, Auburn, and uh, East County, Northeastern County. Very distinct, uh, very much tied to the local community as we later found out, but also have very different uh, unique needs. Um, not all was bad. Early on, we started finding some information that, that your family and children's were, were you know, relative and, and things relative to U.S., relative to the state. Uh, you're doing very, very well uh, with uh, families and children. Uh, we didn't know how well initially. Uh, and the overall homeless number was dropping even though the chronic number was increasing. And so those were our initial observations. And so we wanted to get at the data. And we looked at the point in time count uh, that just has come out. The, the, not all the data is out uh, with this report. The three reds in here are important, or, or sorry, four reds and then the one blue. Um, this, three of these were actually good news. Uh, the overall individual number was going down. The veterans number was going down and the severe in mental health was going down and I think mental health was going down tied with veterans because of a lot of veteran activity and veteran vouchers and I, I think those two were probably interplaying in the drop so all, all three of those were good news uh, your family and children was sustaining it about what it was so it was it was really minimal in terms of relative I don't want to diminish if you're that family that is stuck and having problems, that's tragic for you. But in terms of an aggregated number, how are you doing compared to the state of California? How are you doing compared to the country? Your family and children's side is real good. Uh, the one area was the chronic homeless, that 42%. That number uh, is definitely going up and, and was going up. The rest of your numbers over the last four point in times, which happens every other year, were pretty uh, consistent. The one uh, maybe data that we did not see in point in time that we saw in the survey was you have a pretty, in, in terms of age, your average age of your homeless, your median age of your homeless is 50 years old uh, now, and that's on the higher end of a, of a national uh, number. As we looked at our research, again, I'm a real uh, data guy. I want data to drive, drive it. Not all the data was available. The point in time data had gaps in it. HMIS has a lot of gaps in it. So we went out and did a survey uh, back in December and January that we were really targeting the chronic street homeless. So it's a subset. If you think of uh, chronic homeless, uh, the HUD definition is somebody who's experienced homelessness in four different shelters in a three year period, or has continuously been homeless for a year, or has a mental health uh, or physical qualifying uh, disability uh, to that. It's a pretty high threshold, but there, there, there is a threshold. So that it, the best way to think of that is somebody is one year or more homeless, that's probably the best uh, sort of bar. And then we went and looked at street level homelessness, which is a subset of that, often generally more chronic of the overall number. So we came up with six research questions that we needed to, to really get at in order to develop some policy. Is your problem homegrown or is it from elsewhere? That, that obviously is an initial threshold because that would totally change 
do you have a lot of inbound people or a lot of people from that are from here uh, the rail yard initially had a lot of conversation where everybody we met with the first 60 days was saying the rail yard is is a big part of this so we needed to find out if that was true or not uh, the chronic number and had two different features how big was it high or low and then is it increasing or decreasing uh, uh, within both the point of time data and with our survey then how mobile is the population within the county because that would that would really lead to different types of solutions and it would a one-site solution uh, work so going at those questions and some of you saw the earlier report with a lot of data I've put each of these questions on one slide to it, it both in terms of speed and clarity that is you'll see anywhere depending on how you measure it from 34 percent to 82 percent uh, is really homegrown I mean you're compared to around the country you do not get a lot of folks from out of, out of town and that may be weather driven and it may be an artifact of the you know winter time that people are here uh, the, if, if you choose to be homeless you might go to San Diego you might go to Santa Barbara you might go to Phoenix there are a lot of other places that candidly have a lot better weather uh, especially in the winter time and so the folks that are remaining here are very much tied to here 34 uh, percent went to high school here in uh, what was interesting in the surveys is we had about 10 people not only wrote their high school they went to but like their their mascot of the high school I mean it very much tied to the the the, the community 50 percent had family here 55 percent uh, became homeless here uh, and in 68 percent had lived here longer than five years that it to me is a really powerful uh, number and then 82 percent which is really the most important number did you become homeless while you were here or were you homeless and came in and so this very much shows this is a homegrown uh, problem. This was the rail yard question. All of you have seen this before. 95% uh, of, and again, this is the chronic homeless. This is the street, that this is the toughest group. Uh, did not come in uh, by the rail. About 5% did come in by the rail. This number is, pro this one I'm gonna point at because this is pretty, really the most important slide there is. This is the national number and point in time of chronic, 14.5% just for this last year. So we're comparing apples to apples. Uh, Placer was 42%, almost 42% here. The California number, which is in the report, but we didn't put in the slide because it's getting too busy, is about double that. And then when you look at the chronic homeless, the street homeless that was initially we were engaged because that was the real challenging area, 66 percent uh, met the the HUD chronic definition so to oversimplify this your numbers are twice the number of chronic of California almost three times the number for the United States comparing apples to apples to apples I'm at the it's same year same exact question same exact uh, survey methodology then when you add in the survey that Sean and I did, it gets to 66% in terms of that, the, the group that, that, that is so challenging. So the, the numbers relative to California, relative to United States, or relative to your street population are just way, way, way off the, the charts. And then when we started to say, well, maybe that's an artifact of the percent because your overall number is coming down. So that might have artificially created a, a data artifact that, that went up. So we wanted to look at the actual raw number of individuals that meet the chronic definition. And it, too, is going up uh, significantly uh, here. So something is going on that individuals are from your community are actually becoming more chronic as we as, as the years are going by and and such so that's a really was a really important data information uh, to understand here's the interim mobility uh, very low mobility part of that is probably an artifact of the transportation system part of that is just simple geography uh, but the other is the real affinity to local na local areas people in Roseville identify with Roseville individuals in Auburn 
or Northeast County identified with their area and more or less lined up with their high schools. Uh, there wasn't a big enough data set that we could it, it, that we could go in and do a sort of a secondary or tertiary analysis. It, the trend line looked there, but it probably we couldn't get statistical because the end was not uh, big enough. The multi-site uh, here's the uh, you know where people are living, your primary resident at night of, of where you slept the night before we surveyed you. If you add East County and stack it with Auburn, it gets to be about 50-50 when you compare it uh, to Roseville. Um, now going in beyond data, this is this was the qualitative side that we were asked to also uh, research. The the again. The, our initial hunch that we saw in the first uh, few weeks uh, here, at the more we did our interviews, the more we looked, uh, agencies really were siloed. There is not a, 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 a system. This is the most important thing you need to do to fix is you got to get to a systems approach rather than a bunch of individual agencies operating in, in a silo. Um, again, not integrated, not coordinated. It, it, again, this is part of the problem that it, that is being caused. Um, the quality of data, uh, just the more we dug in, the more questions we had that just simply the data wasn't there. That's why we had to go do the survey. The unvalidated miss, this was again a big frustration, but I think as we got about to end of month three, people were starting to learn about the data and that was already starting, that almost organically through our research project People started to look at their own data, looked at the other data, and I think the cool thing is a lot of people sort of, as we were going through this process, on their own started to say, you know, that's a myth, this is reality, that's a myth, and so people were starting to put, bet rather than it going off of hunches, we're using data to make those assumptions. Um, there's no 24-7 facility, pure, traditional, where you go in, you stay at the same place all day long, you get treatment during the day, you get food there, you sleep at night, there's no place like that for the emergency level. Auburn lacks an emergency portal, you know, we've talked a lot about that before. Roseville's operational model uh, has some real serious issues and I'll go through that in, in a little bit. The big takeaway here that was striking if you look at the individuals that are living in, in, in Roseville, going through the gathering in, are 17.1% more chronic than all the other homeless taken together in the county in terms of time. In other words, they are 17% longer on the street currently in terms of the homeless condition. If anything, they should be lower. Uh, that, so that means the treatment program working there the model is actually not only not working, it actually is increasing the length of uh, time a person is, is homeless. Um, there's a lack of transitional services and affordable housing. If you fix the entire emergency system and you don't have that intermediate, the longer term answer, you'll get clogged. So it, you got to care, be careful not to, to put all your eggs in. You got you to fix the whole system not just one side of the system. Um, again, the upside is your family and children, you're doing very well. That's one of the areas that, that is an absolute success. Looking at national numbers, state numbers, looking at counties around you, your family and children is, is very well run, has very good outcomes. Again, if you're on that three or four or five families that are on a wait list or on a bubble, that's absolute crisis for you, but in terms of aggregated numbers, you're, you are doing very, very well. You're doing very, very well in your overall homeless numbers, and you're doing very well in your veterans numbers. So there's a lot of good news in this. It's not all bad. The bad is just that very unique uh, cut of, of your street level uh, homeless. So going into the recommendations, uh, the first one is, Again, data, your homeless management information system is not being used. It's being used simply to meet just enough to meet the federal contracts. And if you're an agency that doesn't get federal money or not really involved and not using it, the data is not real, real time, meaning inputted within a 24-hour cycle. It's not universal. 
people are not sharing data between agencies. This is one of the things the federal government is doing very, very well. They're actually trying to get out of the point in time count and trying to get everybody in the homeless management information system. And I think we're going to be talking in May a lot about this. But this, you need a data system for two reasons. One is you all as policymakers need to go to a report or a dashboard and every week or every month see how we're doing. Are we getting better? Are we getting worse? And the fact that we had to go do a survey to fill in da gaps shows the, the you, you don't have the data for strategic decision making. So that's one part. But the other is you don't have the homeless management information system to actually help the individuals at a tactical level. And so we need it both for strategy and tactics. We need better decision making, see how we're doing, but we also, that is critical in terms of the case management of the individual to understand what services the persons are getting, to have warm handoffs between the different agencies and such. And so it, it really is a, both a tactical tool and a strategic tool. So recommendation one is about the software package itself. There's some improvements that are needed uh, that, that are both in terms of reporting out. You need to create a universal release so all the agencies share in the data. And if anybody is getting money of any kind, whether city money, county money, the feds already require it, foundation money, I would strongly encourage that everybody be involved in the same system. A lot of the agencies I went to have their own data and it's on hand cards or on a sheet or an Excel sheet and so nobody's talking to each other. So the very first stage of integration is integrating data and that will help you all as strategists but it will also help the individuals that are, that are being helped. And so that's recommendation one. Recommendation two is, is the Roseville operation model. Um, the Gathering Inn is a great agency. They, they, they have a, a great brand. They have buy-in with the, the churches and the faith-based community. They have a good history. Uh, the street homeless uh, in particular really likes them. So I'm by no means saying to, to get rid of the Gathering Inn by, by any means. I'm just saying a model got started 25, 30 years ago and has not been updated. We do not know of another place that rotates people on a 24-hour basis in a national best practice. The, the shortest one we know of is Family Promise that rotates. It's almost the exact model as a gathering in, but they rotate on a weekly basis rather than a daily basis. And if you can move from a daily to a weekly, that will increase your stability by 700%. It does not change the burden of the churches because over a same 12 week period or six month period, the churches we get the same amount of time. So it, it just rather than every night there's the shuffling, it would happen over a week period. And, and I really encourage the faith-based community to look at somebody like Family Promise who has great outcomes and does it on a seven week or a seven day schedule rather than a daily. The daily schedule is so disruptive because when at a time when a person needs stability, and I think this is why the chronic numbers are so much higher in Roseville than anywhere else, because the system itself is actually inputting instability when at a time you need stability. So that's number one. Number two is during a given day, if you follow a homeless person, they start to move back to the gathering in about an hour and a half before the line because they don't want to lose their place in line. They don't want to lose their place because they're not guaranteed. So there's a whole activity of movement of an individual that rather than pursuing treatment during the day or being in job, it's all about making sure they don't lose their place that night. So they come in, they start moving back to the gathering in, they take public transportation, start walking, they get in line at the gathering end, then that will take 30 or 40 minutes sometimes. Later in the month, the lines are bigger. Earlier in the month, they're not. But then they, they, they go through that line, then they stay in that line, then they get processed, and then at that point, then they wait for transportation, and then sometimes a transportation bus loop, it may be 35 minutes, depending on where you're going in church. All that just to get your place at night. So the individuals at the gathering in, rather than pursuing transformational services of treatment, are pursuing food and pursuing getting their mat that night. 
and that process takes it upwards to four to five hours on the high end on the shorter time in the beginning of the month that may only take three and a half hours. But that's the time when a person should be having a job or should be in a treatment service. Instead, it's all about the mechanics of going through. Uh, the third is not 24-7, which we talked about. And 24-7 means you're in a program throughout the whole cycle of the day and you're not off campus, you're not moving around, you're not pursuing food elsewhere. And then the fourth issue there is the commingling of children with chronic men and women is there's nobody in the country that, that says that's a good practice anymore. Uh, that was done 20 years ago uh, for cost effective reasons, but you need, you should never have families with children at a chronic facility ever. That, that just creates many, many problems and concerns. Uh, the third one, which we've talked a lot about, I won't spend too much time on, is the, I think the barracks is a good interim solution. It is not the ideal solution. It's not even a perfect solution, but it, it's a, if you will, a good start. Um, it, it, it would do a lot of good things. Um, I do have concerns about the barracks building. I have concerns that the, the building is old. I have concerns that it doesn't have a commercial kitchen. It doesn't have the ability to expand. It doesn't have the meeting rooms. Uh, but with the options out there, I think it's your best, your best way to start and then just get started, use it, and then over time try to find something that is, that is a better placement over time. My report goes through a lot of outline about what a facility should look like. There's a lot of detail in the report. The, the report also goes into the idea of, of sharing the cost. I really believe this should not be a burden of just the county. It needs to, everybody needs to help. Faith-based community, cities, the county, the business community, because you want a sustainable process uh, that, that is open. And as you open this up, you have to close down other things. You know, I have one whole rec about feeding. Henry's Lawn needs to be closed down. You can't, if, if you want to get people into treatment, that's how recovery occurs, not on a jail cell floor or not out in a park. You need to be inside of a full-time program uh, getting treatment. In my report, I go in a, a section about what I call look, feel, and smell. You want the facility to look good. You want it to feel nurturing and you want it to smell, I mean, you know, nicely, you know, and it, you candidly go in a lot of places and they don't look good, they look cluttered, they don't feel nurturing, they feel institutionalized and, and they don't smell good. If you improve the quality that's the dignifying the individuals we're trying to help, it also improves volunteer commitment, it actually raises uh, more funds because people are more proud, proud of it, and it has candidly better outcomes. And finally, the local community, you're a better neighbor. If, you, if your facility looks good, run well, smells nice, it, it, it improves the, the, you know, the local neighborhood, likes it more. Fourth rec, um, this is a, I, I, there's, I struggled with this a bit because I don't know who should own this problem, the chronic problem. Because everything, if you look at vets are going well, family and children are going well, but there needs to be something at a geographical level that takes all the agencies, the cities, the county, the different agencies, right hand Auburn now, assuming that moves forward, the gathering in, the continuing care. And so what I suggest is that this get put inside the continuum care, in essence, create a work group inside the continuum care that focuses on chronic homeless. There, there needs to be a group that owns this problem, that on a regular cycle works on this, looks at that data every single month and says, did we get better this month? Did we get worse? That vets the program, that coordinates between Right Hand Auburn and the gathering in and coordinates the, the activity because if somebody doesn't own this problem or own this challenge, it's just going to continue to, to sort of, uh, you know, move around. I don't think you want to in increase a bureaucracy. I don't think it should be a governmental agency. And the continuum care is already designed to do that at the federal level. So I think if you put it inside the continuum care, I think is where that would be a good place to put the work group, get all the stakeholders at a table, start giving them their data, and start vetting out um, programs. As part of this, the street feeding needs to realign with the gathering in, 
and street services need to get aligned with the right hand Auburn. If you feed in a park, you're pursuing food and you're not pursuing treatment. I'm not saying don't feed. I'm saying put the feeding programs and align them with the agencies. If you're going to be overnight at a church, that's where the feeding program should be at. If you're going to go to the barracks, that's where the feeding program should be at. They should not be in parking lots. They should not be back of churches. Because what that does is move people off the treatment pack, pass and get people into the chasing the feeding rather than pursuing uh, treatment programs. So you really need to take these feeding programs and align it with you know the Auburn Safe Harbor, align it with the gathering in. The cool thing is that also improves the cost effectiveness of those programs by allowing food to be uh, served there. It lowers the operating costs of, of those facilities. Longer term, you need some housing placements. And this comes in a lot of varieties. This comes in housing first. This comes in tiny houses. This comes in income ta low income tax credits. Uh, it comes in a, a, a thing Sean and I have been helping a few communities on that is showing some success where one church, one church faith community, a congregation, a synagogue, a mosque, actually will adopt a homeless person for a year and commit to helping their, their treatment recovery program and work within the system and provide the resources for that individual. So this comes in a lot of different ways. There's no silver bullet. Um, housing first, it, it works with certain communities. In particular, it works with families with children. It works with males who have had jobs. So that, that works. It doesn't work as well with other subgroups. Housing first is a very expensive model in communities that have high occupancy rates. You have high occupancy rates. Southern California does. Florida beach areas do. Uh, Texas beach areas do. If you were in Kansas that might have an 80% occupancy rate where you have 20% inventory, that's very cost effective to do housing first there. But you have a very high occupancy rate, so that means you almost have to create your inventory, which is very, very expensive to do. So there's really no silver bullet here. You need to try everything, you know, and I think probably the best solutions is a little of everything. And you want to try it because you do need to fix that because if you, if you get your emergency program really working well, but your back end, it will, clog the be it will clog your front end. And so you need to start to create some inventory here. I think one of the best federal programs there are is the Low Income Tax House Credit Program. It's a very, very good program. I don't know. Um, that's a competitive bid on a regional basis. So you may have the greatest program locally but then you lose out to somebody three counties, counties away at the last minute. So that's the downside of, of that. But we need to create that, that capacity. Number seven is that if you had to summarize this, we need to go from a service model to a graduation model. If our goal is simply to serve homeless and to bring things to homeless and to get food to homeless and to get clothing to homeless, that's a service model. That's, that, that can become a very enabling model versus an engaging model that says our expectation is we want to increase graduation rates. Will you help everybody? No, I'm not naive uh, to think that. But if you change your strategies and change your cultural dynamic, much like Peter Drucker talked about in his books, you really will start to make some change. And if you move from agency-centric, which you're very agency-centric now, you're a bunch of silos, and move it into system, you'll have a very different change. If you move from uh, the output to outcome, so instead of how many meals you fed to how many people you graduate, and then move from an engaging, you know, from an enabling to an engaging, you can make a really big, big difference in the culture. And eight, this is a pretty simple one. This is the staffing side to recommendation number one. Recommendation one is the software. Eight, recommendation eight is the staffing and system. This is the people it takes that you need to have uh, to do that. So with that, go to Q&A, or, or if I missed it. OK, board members, uh, any questions or comments before we take comments from the audience? Supervisor Holmes.
Yeah, I have a question about <clears throat> um, the overall rate of homelessness is going down in Placer County. Absolutely. But the chronic rate, the percentage is increasing. Correct. So if the overall rate keeps going down, isn't the chronic rate going to increase anyhow? That That's true, and that's why when we went back to the, the this and I'll show you this data because that's what we were wondering is that an artifact of I can't we were very concerned about that question and that's why we look took this slide this is the real num this is not a percent slide this is the real number of people it's sort of hard to read the data but if you go back to four point in times ago there were 102 people who qu qualified as chronic now the real number is 212 people so you have both an it percent going up, but you also have a real number going up, if that makes sense. That's why this slide was so important. So can you explain to me how the gathering in contributes to the chronic homelessness? Because I know the gathering in provides housing, has gotten a lot of people in housing since they've been in existence. So how are they promoting chronic homelessness if they're uh, putting people back in housing and I think it would come from and I and I was careful to say I'm not saying they do I'm saying the data infers that it does right. and so you know the causality is is always a challenge but the fact that if you look at the people who are staying at the gathering in versus everybody else mm -hmm. they're 17 percent longer on the street than everybody else and everybody else is for the most part not getting any treatment at all and the Roseville model is getting treatment but the treatment looks appears to be counterproductive. And I think it would simply be the instability. So because you need stability, and the model in Roseville is not a stable model. So how is it in, increasing the instability? I mean, I know there are programs that the, the gathering in gives. Is it a fault of what the gathering in is doing, or is it a fault of the people in the programs that don't do the work? Um, it, there, are two, there are probably two factors going on. If you actually stay there the day and look at the people who sleep, the say 75 a night, very few people are involved in any daytime programming there. It's a very small, and I've watched it several days there, both people coming <laughs> and going on the outside and on the inside. So to think people are availing themselves to the program during the day, it, very few people are as a percent. But the other part is, you only get one, the, it's about meals. So people are moving during the day to go get a meal. If, if the gathering in had all 21 meals at their place and stayed at the same place for seven days, I think you would see dramatic improvements because that's exactly what the, the family promise model, the family promise model and the gathering in are virtually the exact model, except for they move once a week, gathering in moves every day. And this moving every day is very inefficient because about five hours of the productive day is wasted in the move process. So there, there are a lot of ways you can improve that. One would be to tell somebody you have a guaranteed slot here tonight. You know, that's, you know there's, some, there's some cheap ways to do, fix this. Mm -hmm. So instead of having people queue up and get in line or there, another would be uh, to say, we're gonna meet at six o'clock, here's the bus, you have a guaranteed place tonight and we'll take you to the next place. So that way you can use the whole productive day. That would be, that, that's a, 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 a quick change. But the best change would happen is to have people stay at that church for all seven days and move on the weekend like Family <laughs> Promise does. You need to increase stability in programming. And, and, and part of that is self-selection out. Part of that is the instability of the process. So I know the Gathering In has monthly meetings with all the churches, and I've attended those, and they all uh, are very enthusiastic about the role they play in the Gathering In. Did you attend any of those meetings, and did you talk to them about the weekly program? I, I've actually asked to, to speak to that group, and I've ne we've never, uh, I've, I've asked to speak. I guess that's the way to put it. All right, well, that would be something. Yeah, the and I would love to do that, but to I talk straight with the churches. Some of the churches that are helping and doing a very good job with gathering in are having problems keeping their t attendance up. Right. And I think that might be a hindrance. Uh, someone might not look at that favorably uh, to give their church space up for a week when they're trying to rebuild right. their, their attendance. And so that's, that's one of the No, things. no, and, it's a, and I don't want to take away from the serious challenge of the mechanics to get to there. I'm just saying if you really want to address this problem, mm -hmm. 
you have to figure out a way to get there. So in the long run, is the gathering and helping reduce the homeless rate in Placer County? I, I don't think it is. I don't think the data shows it is. I, I think it is serving a group of people, but it's not reducing the number, and it's not reducing the length of time of homelessness. But they've helped people get into homes, and if you ask those people, I think. No, and, and they've, there's absolutely a lot of people the gathering in has helped. I'm not taking that away. I'm talking relative to a national best practice, relative to Salvation Army, relative to a union rescue mission. I'm using relative terms. You know, it's sort of like we would give our children grades, you know, we need to go take math. Uh, is a C minus better than an F? Yes. But is an A better than a C? Is, uh, what is a national best practice? In, in terms of that, yeah. it, it is by far stability, is, what it, is to enter an emergency system and then move to a stable, you know, a long-term stable. So is that kind of a generic system? I mean, it's, it's one size fits all? Or? No, no, no. You got to customize You got to customize it. But, but um, Father Joe, uh, who's down in San Diego, who really started this all, and he's still alive, he would argue that if you've been a chronic homeless person, you need stability for nine months. He, he, he goes way out, but he, he, he gets an 83% success rate and they never come back, that these individuals graduate from the street and you never see them again. But he invests nine months into a person before they move into the long-term housing and he has an incredible success rate and, he, and people don't move. They're in one place for nine months on an average. Now, some faster, some shorter. But the moving a person every day is very unstable. It's destabilizing at the time when you need stability. That's the, that's, the be that's the core of the problem. So Placer County has a relatively low amount of homeless people. Overall, absolutely. Overall. And if we do that type of project, the Father Joe's project, it would be very expensive for a relatively us. Uh, a small amount of people right right so that's, very it'd be very expensive so that would be part of our problem well that's why I'm not recommending that model that's why I, I think if you take the gathering in as it is and move to moving people once a week rather than once a day because the in a six-month period the church would have the same amount of activity it would just be intense and and I think the reason why I've asked to go speak to that group is I'd love to make the case for Look at the data, look at the research, look at other places, look, bring in some, maybe somebody from Family Promise, show how it works, and say you do the same thing. So if you, could, if you could figure it out, if there's any way you can help us do this, it will improve the success rate. Because I think in the end, most churches want to improve the success rate. Mm -hmm. And so if they hear the data and understand, they go, God, that's going to be tough for us, but we're going to do it. Or worst case, give it a try for six months and see what happens. And you may lose some churches along the way. Yeah, and you may. The, the flip side is you may lose a little the churches, and maybe some that can't do that. Maybe you ask them to cut, step up on the feeding, step on something else, and do a rotation another way. You know, help the process. Because in the end, if we're really trying to lose, if we're really trying to reduce that chronic, there's something going on in this county that actually, once you become homeless, you have a higher chance of becoming chronic here than, than than the national number by three times. Something's going on here. Well, some of the homeless people may be crazy, but they're not stupid. Uh, they understand where to get services. Right. And having been on my business right there where I saw a lot of homeless people, they had a routine to, to survive. So right. I've, I've observed that. So, OK, thank you for your yeah. Supervisor Montgomery. Thank you, Dr. Marbet. Um, as always, it's very enlightening to see your presentation. Um, I actually see, I, I understand Supervisor Holmes' concerns. I actually see the gathering in as an incredible opportunity for us. You used the, the phrase self-selecting, and you and I have talked a little bit about this. And I've said, you know, anyone who is willing to spend that much time trying to find some place to stay for one night is prime territory for us to provide a higher level of services for a longer time frame. And so I, I think that the, the, the opportunity is really with the model like the gathering in but doing exactly as you say and extending that period of time i mean there's you know between i think you said 65 and 85 people who who use that facility on any given night depending on the time of the month to me that's 65 or 85 people who are saying 
I would like some assistance because they are putting so much time to that single night. And I, I see Susie nodding her head back there. Um, and I just want to say, you know, anything that, that I can personally do to help in those conversations with the churches or other groups, it doesn't have to be churches, um, to say, how do we get to that seven night model? I think Susie would probably be totally on board with that as well. I haven't talked to Susie about it, but you know, her goal, her hope, her outcome that she's striving for is to get people out of homelessness and to get them services. Um, and I just think there's an incredible opportunity here that our board and our community shouldn't miss. And again, it's back to that question of self-selection. These are folks who are saying, I want to stay somewhere. Now, I'm sure they would rather want to stay somewhere seven nights in a row than one night in a row. And it's, this is an opportunity for us to, to do that. Um, different question. The HMIS program, I know that's a computer program that's available through, I believe, the federal government. How much is it to purchase that? So what, what would it cost, for example, to provide every one of our service providers with that so that we are all interconnected in a real-time database? It, it, this is one of the good and bad of the federal government. Uh, it is an unfunded mandate. The federal government says you have to have this, but they don't they used to give you some funding, but they're phasing that funding down. And so there's about eight or nine vendors around the country. And if you go deeper in my rec, I didn't, I didn't want to bore you with the trivia, but I think there needs to be quick review. You, you got bowling now. I think you need to start, check to see if they, how cost effective it would be to make the changes with them. If they don't give you a good price, then go look at some other vendors, because there are a lot of vendors that, that, that do it. Because uh, you just need some tweaks. You need some report tweaks. You need some input. You need some customization uh, on it. But I, the thing we've used in other cities that are pretty effective is we try to find a funding pool where every agency gets one license for free. And that way there's no reason not to input. Uh, but that means you've got to go find that, that, <clears throat> that money to do that. But when you say every agency, my understanding of the HMIS program is the Gathering in and the Seventh-day Adventist Church and everybody else who's part of the larger solution needs to have this same program Absolutely. and needs to be able to tie into it. So that's dozens of agencies and entities in, in Placer County and, and um, you know, part of our job is to figure out how we fund things. Right. How, how do we pay for services that, that people need? Um, and so I'm, I'm very interested in how we get to funding that. And the federal government not giving us any help is not a surprise. Right. Um, but generally, I'm someone who's providing services. How much is it going to cost me to buy an HMS program? Um, your number is higher here than in most places, but because you have less agencies involved. And so I'd hate to give you a number, you know, and not, because I think the number will go lower if you make some improvements first. And then that, that per number. In most communities around the country, we're able to get the license to somewhere between 200 and 700 dollars a year, to give you an idea. And that's for each entity that you Yeah, for, it. but it's one license per uh, there. The way these systems work, if you have two at an agency, it's two times 700. But, but I, think, I think you need to get, and that's just the way their business model is. I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with it. But I think each agency needs to have at least one free license. That way there's no excuse of not participating. Okay, and, and I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to understand what you mean by agency. So does the gathering in need to go buy their own license? That's the way it, the model works is that's part of, and, and the Fed government says if you want a federal contract, you have to buy a license. But what happens is, for example, the food banks, food pantries are not tied into the HMIS system here but they very much are very interconnected to the homeless community here. Uh, that data is not, uh, what would Jesus do, uh, is not connected to that system. Uh, the feeding program that goes on uh, up the street in the parking lot is not in the, they all have their own data system. None of that is getting put into the system. Right, and that's exactly what I'm getting at, which is each of these, are, and, and I'm not saying that this is a, necessarily an impediment that we can't get beyond, but we need to understand as, you know, potentially a funding mechanism for these right. that we're looking at 
$700 for every entity, whether it's a food bank or the Gathering Inn or the Seventh-day Adventist Church, in order to tie all that data and those services Absolutely. together. Okay, so that's, that's really what I'm trying to get at. On another um, uh, data and economic-based question, um, and again, this is going to be a tough question because this is not your area, um, but we've talked about having to open some sort of 24-7 center, whether in Auburn or in Roseville or both. Um, any idea roughly what those sorts of costs are to set something up and then operate it that would serve the needs that you've identified? If, if, if you can get to an economies of scale, the sort of national number is 15 to $30 a day per person per night once you get to an economy of scale. And different buildings have different economies, so it's really hard to say that building is 50 and that building's 100. But you, you should be in that somewhere in that range, 50, 15 to $30 a day. And that's for operational costs. That's, that's exclusive of, of in, infrastructure. Yeah, that's a, that, 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 that would include soft infrastructure, you know, like utility, but not, not any physical improvements okay. and such. But that would include staffing, security, uh, food, case management, et cetera. And our point in time count, I think it was slide 11, showed 541, I think, that we counted this year. It was... Um, I'm trying to get to it. There we go, 540 individuals. Yeah. So that would be, say we could house them all, that would be 15 minimum per night times 540 for operational costs. And that number is your higher number. That includes your family and children in there. That includes some people already in existing programs like Salvation Army. That includes mm -hmm. VET. So that number would be significantly lower. I think the, if you were to look more to your universe would be back to your question with the 214 i think on that that slide that's sort of your chronic unsheltered number so i think that's a better number to that would be your highest in number okay would be that that whatever your unsheltered chronic number okay uh, and i ask not to you know put you on the spot here in terms of coming up with specific dollars to placer county because that's very difficult to do um I ask because we have another agenda item that's going to be coming forward that's, you know, frankly talking about economics largely. And we as a board have to prioritize what do we put taxpayer dollars to. Um, and so something, and maybe this is for, for, for Jeff, um, something that I'm going to want some assistance with moving forward if this board says let's move forward on something is a better understanding of what those costs would really be. For infrastructure, if we did say, okay, we're going to fund something, or maybe we're gonna partner with somebody to fund something, what would those costs be? Because we have this budget that we have to balance every year, you know, and we have to provide elections and roads and libraries and other things like that. So, so let me just offer an estimate. If we uh, took the higher number, at $30 a day for 200 individuals, that's about $6,000 a day. So on a monthly basis, $180,000. If you uh, did that 12 months a year, you could see you're over $2 million. Mm -hmm. and, and again, that's exclusive of infrastructure. Does that include uh, employee costs, benefits, retirement, or is that just operational to provide services to that, That'd be a fully loaded cost. Fully loaded, yeah. okay, great, thank you. Yeah, and we're just uh, running 2.3 million. If okay. you were to take the high number, and the two four if if everybody agreed to go into the program and I'm not you know there's always a seventy percent of that so that'd be your high your high your upper marker okay great that's very helpful for my understanding thank you supervisor Graham yeah um, no I appreciate your your information my 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 um, uh, thought here is that you know. We, we've done some things in the past, and, and I know what you're saying about the gathering in. I know Susie doesn't take that, any offense to that. I, I hope not. I think she does some wonderful things. I, I, yeah. I think she does some wonderful things, but I, I think what I'm getting out of this is that if we continue to do the same things that we're doing, um, you know, it's kind of like the definition of insanity, but we've got to tweak the model. That's all we've got to do. Um, the question is, how do we do that? And I think that you've kind of laid out the the process of some of the things that we need to start doing in order to get to those particular outcomes. You know, 
and it's the definition of what works for us. You know, I think that's the, the most important thing, the most important goal that we have. Um, it's obvious from what you've said that what we've done for children and families has seems to be working. Um, so it seems to me that, that if we're going to address this other uh, issue with regards to the chronic folks that we have to put in place and tweak the system in order to, to, to assist in furthering that outcome and align it with the same outcome that we are with families. Now, trying to say that we, you know, that we're doing well or that the numbers are going to go or that doesn't really do anything to address the problem, does it? Nope. Okay. Um, you know, I, I would agree with you. I have my concerns about the barracks as well. Um, uh, but I would also agree that there, that is a decent start and that's some place that we need to start. And I do appreciate the fact that you have mentioned that this isn't just a county problem. You know, we've got a lot of jurisdictions here, a lot of people, a lot of moving parts. Um, you know, most folks uh, in those jurisdictions have a tendency to, to focus on economic development, which isn't a bad thing. But at the same time, if we don't get a handle on this issue now, it's just going to get worse as we grow economically and in, in greater stature throughout the next 50 years. So uh, I appreciate the information that you have, and I think um, that you it's come at, a, at an opportune time to be able to do um, some further work on this, uh, on this issue. So. And, and to address your two front end, I went back to this slide here. This, these are, this is not my data here. This is your point. This is from your community data point in time. And if you look at what's happened from 11 to 13 to 15, is over doubled your chronic uh, homeless, regardless of the overall number. This is the number of people. And I don't think there's any reason to think that slides, if you don't, if you keep doing exactly what you're gonna do, I think we can come back two, two years from now and that number's gonna be about 250 to 260. Then, but that's what the growth, that's what this cur curve, this is what the raw data, not my data, your data is showing. And that's why I think this is the most important slide in the whole presentation because if you don't make a change and I also would reiterate I, the gathering in is a great organization they should be the organization they got the credibility they got the institutional they got the church connectivity but but I think we all have to understand if you want an improvement something has to change and that curve is not cha that curve is going straight up now and that's why that's why we got to make some changes and that's really the the question here is do we want an improvement um, I would like to see it but that's up to the, the rest of the board. Some people may not want it. Right. Supervisor Wagon. Yeah, thanks uh, for all the work, appreciate it. I uh, particularly um, am drawn to the, the broad strategic approach and devil always ends up being in the details and the tactics, but uh, you know, as we go forward, I'd like county exec's office and Jeff, your shop to bring back recommendations that fo focus on the total. And then focusing on uh, this particular curve that uh, is uh, showing right now the, the chronic issue, I, th I think the way for us to look at it in terms of cost, knowing that we do have broad budgetary responsibilities, and we're gonna be hearing another one uh, shortly. Um, f for me, uh, I think the question really should focus on uh, projecting our costs out maybe another five years as compared to what they are now with changes and without changes. We have exactly the same behavior and same strategy in place, or, or in other words, we do nothing, uh, and you can assume uh, that that curve is gonna look similar or not, I guess, and we could debate that forever. But if it does look the same uh, as compared to making changes and what expectations should we have for those changes, how much of a reduction can we achieve in the chronic homeless uh, number uh, then that's going to also obviously be a huge cost driver. Uh, so we're going to have essentially the cost of changing our plan and putting in place an implementation package. Uh, but of course the outcome should be both uh, cost effective and um, strategic as it relates to the social benefits of, of accomplishing what we're trying to accomplish. So those are my comments at this point. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so. As somebody who is very reticent to use uh, kind of societal buzzwords, I will use two of them, and that is enabling versus empowering. And our system today, by virtue of seeing the growth in the chronic number while a decline overall in the total population, 
means that there is a population that we have figured out how to enable to survive within homelessness as opposed to empowering them to grow out of homelessness. And that's the shift that you're looking at, is how do we take the existing infrastructure and shift it to one that grows, that, that stops enabling and starts empowering. You, you've said it way better than I did. So that being the case, when we identify a universe of, of two, call it two to 300, uh, you, you said when we talk about these, these various management systems, that there are eight of them that are federally, federally recognized homeless management information systems. Yet, as a businessman, I can go out today and choose from between three, four, five dozen customer relationship management software systems that are cloud-based that allow for um, uh, multiple data points of entry from multiple users around the world on any given customer that I might be tracking. And I can do that today. I can go Salesforce. I can, I can modify Salesforce in virtually any way I want to track a customer if we start treating these people as, as, as customers along those lines and identify their various points of access to service through each of these. How does that not get us more toward this? Because what I'm focused on, and, and, and anybody that attended any of the hearings where we're talking about the DeWitt Center, I want to provide opportunity but attendant with that is accountability. And so while, yes, we want to provide a consistency of service uh, with uh, repetition of location and those expectations being set, by the same token, I want the accountability associated with the kinds of programs that will actually get people out of homelessness. And so is there any prohibition against the county utilizing uh, an existing off-the-shelf CRM system that I as a businessman could go out and buy and, and that that is customizable that allows me to essentially assign a customer number and anytime one of these people shows up at one of these service centers it the service provider says that Bill Jones customer number one two three showed up today and this was the service that was provided to him and so we can track the services that they're getting at the same time, we then have the ability to hold them accountable for checking in on those rehabilitative services that we're trying to provide. You, you got several questions in there, so I'll go right to the, the software one. I wish what you were describing was that simple, but the Fed's requirements for any of the agencies to get federal money, they have to use one of the programs that's in essence authorized by them or yet, approved by them. And yet you're them. saying that we're no longer receiving reimbursement for those systems. It's so, an unfunded mandate. So we can waive off that requirement yeah. and what's it cost us? Yeah. Well, if you waive, if you, if you get in trouble with HUD in terms of their reporting software, you put at risk the federal funds for the services those agencies have. So that's the risk you have. Kind of flip, like the way the flip, that they, the, they enforced drinking ages across all states federally was by, by withholding federal highway funds. The 80% match on the, federal highway. The same, 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 same way. I wish it was that simple, but now what you described is that internal accountability is what a case manager is supposed to do and be able to see every touch in the system. And I'll give an extreme case. Somebody who fall, I'll give two extreme cases. Somebody who totally falls through the gap who we're seeing throughout the system clearly has a mental health issue, but we're seeing no contact with the mental health. Mm -hmm. that, that's a gap. Right. Likewise, you have the accountability built in if they're getting a bag of food uh, from three or four to the different pantries and you look in, well, how many bags of food do you have? That's right. a, it, you know, so it provides accountability on both sides of the system because if the goal is really to get people help, we know how to get people help. Will everybody get off the street? No. Can we get large numbers off the street? Yes. Throughout the country, there are many programs who get 50% off the street, but you're in a 24-7 program. Mm -hmm. You're not moving around, you're not bouncing around, you're not going here for food in here. You're in one physical location and the whole day is programmed. Everything about that day is programmed and it's customized to you and every data, every piece of information through the day as you hit the contact of the system goes into that computer software. Those are the programs that are very successful. St. Louis, Dallas, there are a lot of programs. Miami that are just 
knocking it off the charts with it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. If there are no other comments by board members at this point, uh, we will go ahead and open it up to a public comment. Um, so uh, invite you to go ahead and step forward. Please identify yourself. Um, please try to keep comments limited to three minutes, but for certain folks such as providers of current services, uh, we will certainly make allowance on that time to accommodate a more robust discussion. Good morning. Surprised to see me, I'm sure. <laughs> Susie DeFossett, Executive Director of the Gathering Inn. So, um, lots of things are being batted around and talked about, um, and it's great that we're actually having this conversation. I think it's wonderful. We at uh, PCOH have been talking for years, and it's good to be up here. So is this a white horse with black stripes, or is this a black horse with white stripes? What I want to talk to you about is the whole zebra. Yes, our shelter uses 48 churches in the South Placer community, 15 other service clubs, smaller churches, and volunteer groups to provide shelter and food on a nightly basis. The research I've read never defines where a person is sheltered as an indicator of their ability to move out of homelessness. If this were the case, all the people sleeping at the DeWitt Center in the middle of the plethora of county services available would not be homeless now. The Gathering Inn provides 25 of the 33 best practices services that are listed in Dr. Marbet's report, including a free substance abuse treatment program and five more that aren't on the list. We engage four case managers who last year worked with over 346 people to move them forward and out of homeless. Unfortunately, we were not able to move all of them out of homelessness. Between our shelter that's open up at 3.30 in the afternoon to 8 o'clock in the morning, seven days a week, and our resource center that's open Monday through Friday from 8 o'clock in the morning to 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we provide services for 90% of the week going on. If we had the funding, yes, we could be open on the weekends and have our resource on the weekends, but unfortunately we do not have that funding. During the day, the guests are use these hours to meet with the case managers, attend to their treatment program, and attend mandatory life skills, which guarantees them a spot in the shelter. Of the 509 persons that we served in the 13-14 year, 231 people who used our shelter reported being first time homeless ever, ever. 125 met HUD's definition of chronically homeless. These statistics are, being, are different than what's being reported to you. We have, compelling, we have been compiling statistics for the last 10 years, which you have in front of you. We've been using HMIS for the last three years at $2,500 a year, Jennifer. That's what our, it costs to buy a license. And then we pay for the staff to do the input. We use our statistical collection to ensure that we're providing the needed services to address the root causes of our guest homelessness. We're the first step on the ladder out of homelessness. We're the waiting room for those that are waiting to move into county programs, other programs, or the domestic shelter. Families with children who are living on the streets are given a safe harbor, free of persons under the influence or sex offenders, and are given and are often adopted by the churches and given much more hope than being in a shelter. <coughs> All this time, our case managers are working to move them out of homelessness as fast as possible. I don't believe a child should ever be in homelessness. The Gathering Inn is a nonprofit organization offering a community-based response to South Placer's homeless population. With the assistance of more than 60 churches, our mission is to provide physical, mental, spiritual restoration for men, women, and children. We provide our guests with social health and case management services that will help them become active participants in our community. Last year, we put 160 people back into housing, which has been a congruent 32, 33% of our population goes back into housing for the last three years. I would offer that you spend some time with my statistics because you're going to find that, yes, we do have a population of chronically homeless, 
but we also would have a larger population of chronically homeless had the gathering and not been available for the last 10 years. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, board. Uh, my name is CJ Jawahar, Roseville Residence, 1568 Morning Glory Lane. There couldn't be a better day than today to talk about homelessness. I, I, I was driving up here with the heavy rain. I, I couldn't stop thinking about those 540 folks out there without homes. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Marbot. Your, your report is exceptional. The takeaway message from your report today for me is those three key words, transformational, transitional, and the stability. We talked about economy. Uh, we talk about the viability, we talk about providing homes temporarily, but my request to the board to consider how we are going to spend any money that we are going to allocate to those agencies to transform those homeless people to a better stable life. I read a story in SACB about uh, Placer County homelessness. There's one case just stuck in my mind. A technologist for more than 20 years unfortunately lost his job, was on the street. Now to me, those three words is important when I talk about or when I think about the technologist. And life takes us to different places, unfortunate things happen to us, but providing a transformation. Um, I'm not sure how much your report addressed to those criteria. For instance, building resume, helping them with a job search, networking them with all the agencies that we have. That's, that is very key as a, as a resident who contribute, also passionate about the homeless people to improve their life. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon, or good morning, where am I? <laughs> good morning, everyone. Um, and again, uh, I'd like to thank the board for getting Dr. Margaret and, um, you know, and looking at a strategic plan. I just wanted to, um, as a local churchman, my name is Michael Carroll. I live up in Atwood next to the prison. Um, and um, when I came here the last time, you asked about praying for rain, and it came on Friday. So we're having another meeting on the homeless, and it's raining again. So. Please, God, uh, you know, God, God hears the cry of the poor. Again, a strategic plan is needed because um, all the different um, people that are trying to help, one of my uh, concerns is that um, you're going to burn a lot of us off. You know, we came in with goodwill, the right hand of Auburn. One of our members is, um, works with Father Joe down in, and his name is Carol as well, Joe Carroll. Um, the family are into the, into the rescue business. But anyway, uh, um, he raises a million um, dinners a year for San Diego, and he's part of our community. He lives half the year here. We've got great people in this community, but my fear is that somehow or another we'll burn people off if we don't get some strategic plan going forward. Um, Again, there's another uh, strata there as well. We've got so many people in our communities and our churches raising kids that are not their kids. I'm just saying we get so much asking for help uh, to pay for repair of cars. Like our churches, I can honestly God tell you, um, the amount of work that churches have to do to keep people out of the homeless level. And then when people get into the homeless level, um, and I liked your comment, you know, for those that are in it, it's, it's, it's a terrible cross. And I would hope that during this season of Easter that, um, and Passover that it would be a time of hope. So I'm asking your help, guys. Um, I was going to retire, and I just felt I need to give this a bit of, you know, so if you kind of come along with me, you'll, I'll be leaving town soon. Uh, <laughs> if you don't, you'll have this old Irish guy uh, standing up here maybe every month. <laughs> Praying for rain, but praying for the homeless. Um, again, um, and I, um, I can't un imagine what it has taken to get the gathering in where it is. When I came into the parish, I because we have a school, we were supposed to not have the um, kids and homeless or you know the fears. So we we helped at the weekends, and I 
definitely we can go a week or two in the summer uh, to help. Um, so I hope that we can all work together, um, politicians, us clergy. Um, just give you an example, and I'll just mention three or four. Pat has gone into uh, clean and sober. Um, we have another lady um, that we had to get into mental health, but um, she is okay. Um, yesterday I drove two people up to Colfax, which I'm doing nearly every week. I'm not bringing the people here. I kind of move them on if I can um, and give them 100 bucks, 200. Sometimes it's just that little bit that they need. It isn't, there's an awful lot of people, besides the homeless and the broken and the chronic, there's an awful lot of people, all they need is 100 or 200 bucks, and they, they can make it. But there's nobody to give them that. So I'm just saying, if we can get a strategic plan, and I'd like to continue being part of this, and, but I'd also like to retire. So God bless you all, okay? It occurs to me that if perhaps we scheduled a two-week workshop on this, we might put an end to our drought. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Victoria Connolly, Auburn Area Homeless Forum. I also sit with Right Hand Auburn. Um, just a couple of points. Um, there was a lot of talk about additional economic burdens uh, with a program uh, that served the homeless. I'd like to point out that there would be a concomitant reduction in costs for emergency room law enforcement. In fact, I believe at Dr. Marbot's last community meeting, he mentioned the figure of $3,000 per emergency room stay. Um, and here we're hearing 15 to 32 house a homeless person a night. So that's about 100 to 200 people a night that could be helped versus one emergency room. Uh, taxpayer-funded admission. And the other um, issue that I had a question about in the report was it said that sex offenders could not stay in Auburn Safe Harbor, um, a shelter, uh, a large shelter like is being proposed. And that isn't kind of what we gleaned from our research. And I was curious, insofar as Jessica's Law has now the portion uh, that has to do with schools and near parks, uh, insofar as that's been struck down uh, as an undue burden by the Supreme Court on the uh, uh, offenders and did not further the interests of the state, I was thought maybe perhaps Dr. Marbot being out of state did not hear about that decision and whether or not a footnote could be put into the uh, report to explain that. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Duran, I did want to respond to your question about the, the hospital beds. Sure. You know, I've had a, a fairly high level discussions with uh, some of the area medical facilities and explain to them you know, what type of facility, you know, at 30,000 feet. Um, could provide, you know, uh, food closet, uh, could provide medical, could provide, you know, uh, other types of services. And um, these folks who are in positions of authority were very interested in having those discussions because, as you said, those beds cost, you know, 3000 an hour. And if there's something that we can provide that accomplishes the, the same mission, um, their insurance companies may be very interested in, in, in wanting to partner. Um, there's also another piece to this as well, the transitional housing uh, model. Um, and we did this with uh, the Acres of Hope and also uh, Town Homes, where we were able to uh, provide the opportunity to use low-income housing credits in, in a specific area. Uh, and, we, and we took them from uh, over in my district and put them up here in, uh, in Ophir. And that would be also an incentive for the development community to um, maybe partner with us as well. There, there's a lot of different ways that we can skin this cat. It's just the fact that we have to do something. So I appreciate your thought. It was Bowman. Bowman, Bowman, yeah. thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you, I apologize. Good morning, uh, Dan Appel, pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Just a couple of uh, three brief mentions. Um, as I sat and listened today, I realized this has a potential to turn into uh, who runs the best program. And uh, there is something for all of us in this, in Dr. Marbot's proposals, 
There's also uh, the realization that all of us are going to have to change how we do business in order for this to work. I don't think anybody in their right mind would criticize not only the commitment and the creativity, uh, but the accomplishments of, of the gathering in. But I didn't hear Dr. Marbot saying it was a bad program. I, I heard him saying that to be a really great program, there were some changes that they could make that would improve it. Uh, the, the gathering in uh, takes care, in order to, to participate in the gathering in program, you have to pretty much be dry, clean and sober in order to take part. That doesn't include most of the people that we're talking about being chronic homeless. And so there's no reason why the Gathering In can continue to do what they do very well and, and there still be a, a crying need for something else. And I'm concerned that we all get defensive. If, if, this, if I read Dr. Marbot's report, and I read it last night and this morning correctly, uh, in order to be really successful, our program at the Adventist Church would have to undergo some significant changes as far as dovetailing in with uh, a larger program. And it'd be easy to get defensive and say, wait a minute, no, uh, we're, we like what we're doing and, and uh, we're not going to change. But we have to ask ourselves at some point, what's most important, the program or the people? And uh, the same thing's true with the county. You know, uh, you're going to have to ask yourself if defending turf, whatever the turf might be, is most important. Or if the people are most important. Driving up here today, there were several people I passed in that 38 degree rain, walking up trying to find a place to find shelter. There were a lot more that uh, slept last night under the, the eaves and alcoves of our buildings. Uh, because we haven't acted yet. And I hope we don't get caught in a cycle of recriminations and accusations and comparisons. In, in Romans, Paul says at one point, comparing themselves with themselves, they became fools. And it would be real easy for us to become very, very foolish trying to compare programs. Susie and I had the privilege of having dinner, or lunch, I guess it was, the other day. <coughs> and we talked about the fact that we really need to become complementary rather than competitive. And I think uh, I can speak for all of us uh, who are in the helping community. That, that's what we desperately want. But it's going to take, somebody said uh, a, a little while back that, that one of the reasons the, they set the, the, uh, the bar so high for some of the requirements for Right Hand Auburn with the use of the, of the uh, barracks was they wanted us to have some skin in the game. I'm telling you right now, we have about as much skin as we can get in the game. What we'd like to ask is for the county to put some skin in the game, some serious skin, because it's not ultimately our problem, it's your problem. Father, Mike, and myself, our primary role is to help people spiritually. Uh, but these are your citizens, and it's time for y'all to put some serious skin in the game. That man didn't retire even though he desperately wanted to go back to Ireland because he cares about the homeless in Placer County. And by the way, if you want to do a, a terrific commemoration one of these days, declare a, a Mike Connolly day. Okay? And, uh, yeah, yeah. and no, 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 you know, seriously, you know. But folks, I, can, 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 can all of us listening, rather than this being a, a chance to try to to defend our turf. Can we all get together, please, and solve this problem before more people die, before the problem gets worse? It's doable if we'll just work together. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bridget Barnes, 3262 Penryn Road. Um, I'll be as brief as I can. Um, I, I also want to thank Dr. Marbet and the county for spending uh, these funds to try and get a handle on the problem. Um, the uh, essential points, one of which was uh, questioned by Supervisor Montgomery, is costs. So that everyone just has a handle on our preliminary operational costs. And this is 16 hours without the services that Supervisor Euler mentions and are critical, the integration that I'll come back to in just a second. 
Um, we're figuring right now our estimate is 25000 to 26000 a month. Uh, that's the payment to our jobber who is going to be operating at Volunteers of America and all of the special insurance requirements that the county has. That's exclusive of the construction costs that we are hand having. Um, the keys got just delivered, so construction starting this week, thank God. And we hope to be ready by the first week of May, May, May so that we will actually have some data when we come back and see you in, October, in August. The other point, though, that Dr. Margaret made, and you keep coming back to, Kirk, is essential. The reason I pushed for and all of us pushed for a location up at DeWitt was the idea that proximity, physical proximity to the existing county services was going to encourage the use, but it doesn't integrate and mandate that use as we're starting out in the process. That's why, to me, as a business person also, um, it would seem to me that the, the essentials is for a funding source that allows all of the uses, whether it's the food lockers or St. Teresa's or Seventh Day or Gathering In or Right Hand as a separate unit to do the infeed. And as this coordinated system is created, which is going to be both private business, religious, and county money, not only the data, but the overall flow is created. Because what we have to keep in mind is ours is, is we're very conscious of, a temporary attempt. We'll be back, we hope it'll extend for a year. But Dr. Marbet's study is talking about at least a five-year system up in Auburn before a new building can be built, if we all agree on a location and a rezone and all of the stuff that has to go into that. Um, and because of that, it's going to require a unique strategic placement that allows <coughs> entities like Right Hand and Gathering In and Seventh Day and St. Teresa's and all the churches to be integrated in the system as a whole. Because that's where a major part of the funding is going to come from, but not just the funding, but, you're, but, but I'm assuming you're expecting us all that we've stood up here and talked to you to be there to actually operate it and to provide those services. That's the only way I can see this working. So um, in any event, thank you very much. And I hope you will uh, move forward in assigning a strategic plan that we can all participate in, separate and distinct from the approvals. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lisa Golden, 9755 Magellan in Loomis. And I sincerely want to thank you supervisors for taking the time to have a study made. Thank you, Dr. Marbet, and all of the agencies that have stepped forward in the years caring for our homeless, because it's truly indeed a problem. As uh, a person who has a family member who is chronically homeless, I understand this very personally. Um, I really appreciated your innovative thinking, Supervisor Euler, in the software. Another idea throwing out there is that is there a possible way to get a program developed by someone that would meet government uh, standards and qualify for funding? Is there someone who would have those skills that would donate that time? Are there um, buildings that are currently empty, do it, uh, count fairgrounds, I don't know, um, that maybe could be used as a stable because I've seen the um, difficulty in moving and you got to get ready, go take a shower and where are you going to put your locker for your stuff and it is very unstabling and it's been difficult to maintain stability for my family member along with mental illness. There's adult, adult systems of care. Um, you know, another service I'm hearing, collaboration. We have a lot of good people, smart people, caring people, and I think it is definitely important to use our funds wisely um, when we're talking about demolishing a building, costing, you know, millions of dollars. Could those dollars be better spent? Um, with that said, I'm, I'm going to be praying not only for more rain, but that a good strategic plan, a successful 
strategic plan of collaboration with all these wonderful, smart, caring people is successful. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to address the board on this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and bring it back to the board. This is not an action item, however, board certainly has the opportunity to provide uh, mm -hmm. our thoughts in terms of direction, where to go from here. And so uh, I'll start with Supervisor Montgomery, who, whose light is lit. Go ahead. Thank you. I really wanted to thank everybody who's come and shown up and weighed in on this and has been part of this long and complex process that is really just the start of a long and complex process. Um, I think Pastor Dan's comments about getting rid of the silos um, and really working together is absolutely spot on. And we all have to have skin in the game. And, and frankly, I think everybody in this room does. What I'm seeing is there are certain partners who aren't in this room. And that concerns me. Um, and so I think part of the, what we need to do working together, the faith-based community, the business community, the county, is to really build some of those other relationships that we need to build uh, within the larger county as a geographic region um, to make sure that we can site places without a lot of nimbyism, that we can get facilities built, that they can get funded, that we can work together collaboratively to do the tracking that we need to do, to get the outcomes that we all agree that we need to get. Um, I, I think the barracks is a great start um, but it's just a start, and we all recognize that. It's, it has to go so much more beyond that because, frankly, you know, we're, we're recreating a night-by-night -night process here, and we understand that that's not going to get us our best outcome. Um, a couple of very specific things about your report and your recommendations. I really want to make sure as we move forward that we figure out a way to fund the HMIS programming for all our partners so that we can start to collaboratively track that information. But as part of that, I also want to say we need to tell people who aren't willing to help us get to that HMIS tracking, sorry, we can't give you money. We've got to focus our dollars the most effective way possible because these are Placer County tax dollars and state dollars and federal dollars that we're spending. And it's our obligation to spend them as effectively as possible. And, and that's true whether it's the faith community or the business community or governments. Those are our obligations. Um, I think the idea of um, you know figuring out where we can put a service center in Auburn and Roseville and provide services probably online, um, maybe focused through HHS in Eastern Placer County particularly, that is absolutely critical. We have to take the next step, which is buildings in actual physical locations where we can provide not just overnight services to people, but the services that have to go with them because the overnight services we all agree are not the answer. They have to be in combination with those specific outcomes that Kirk talked about. Enabling people is not the right thing to do. Giving people the ability to improve and change their lives is something that we all have to do together as a community. Um, I, I, I think about you know the recommendation about street feeding and services need to realign themselves with treatments um, and existing you know, sort of more comprehensive approach to this. Um, I, I think we're, in some respects, having the same conversation about fire districts, small fire districts. You know, these individual pieces that have siloed and have provided really important services over the years, that model doesn't work anymore. How do we create that new model? And, and giving up the ego and giving up the this is my territory, critically important. And I can tell you that I'm, I'm one member of five on this board, but I'm willing to say it's not about the county, it's not about the city, it's not about a particular church or a particular organization, it's about all of us working together as a community to serve our family members. Because, you know, as we just heard, these are our family members who are in chronic homelessness and we don't want to see that number continue to increase. Um, the case management system, that's probably something that I want to understand a little bit better and, and work with uh, Jeff 
and understand what does that really mean? How do we get a more robust case management system? I think the HMIS piece is going to be a huge and critical part of that because until we actually understand the various services and where and how they're being provided, I don't think there's a good way to get a grasp on larger case management, and that is something that's, again, critically important. Um, so I'm both heartened and saddened <laughs> by the information in the report. Um, I think a lot of us are doing a lot right now, and it's very clear that we could and should and must do a lot better. And um, I just want to encourage us as a county to put our ego aside and work with everybody else and figure out how do we blow out those boundaries, how do we create a critical mass that supports the needs of the least among us. And so um, all you're asking for is direction today. That's my direction. And thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Duran. Yeah, um, and I agree um, pretty much with, with everything that uh, Supervisor Montgomery just, just said. I, I, I will add a couple of things that um, I, I would like to see um, a report or a process similar to what we did with the criminal justice policy because there's some of these things, there's recommendations that have been made that we can do that will be very low cost and the timeline to get them done will be, you know, months as opposed to years. And then I would like to see, you know, kind of like a chart that shows what, what we need to do before to have a little bit longer term effect and then also the long term, the long term issues like, for example, the, the A, a 24-7 type situation. And then obviously we have to have our staff folks plug the numbers in to what these things are going to cost. And I think that in and of itself will kind of give us a natural direction based on what uh, resources we have um, in order to, to move this process forward. And it's going to be a very, um, it's going to be a very difficult, it's going to be very interesting, and it's a very necessary process. And, and leadership calls for that. You know, uh, we have to make decisions. If you don't, dec if you don't make decisions, you're not doing your job, you know, and 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 trying to wish these things away isn't gonna isn't gonna do anything. Um, so um, you know that's kind of my my, my thought. Um, there's gonna come a time, just like with all of these other issues that we're dealing with, fire libraries, um, yeah, you know, that we have to make decisions on these. And I and I fully agree with what Supervisor Montgomery said about you know having um, you know this is my kind of mentality when you have a diminishing resource um, we have to utilize our uh, opportunities the best that we can I mean the 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 uh, wastewater treatment plants up here in Auburn there's a, a perfect example they're four miles apart but yet the state is beset us with a lot of regulations that make running those operations extremely costly so it doesn't make sense to have two of them um, we have to utilize our resource uh, better and that's kind of the mindset that I have it's there's nothing personal if this was in my district I'd be making the same decision um, but that's you know that's what I have to say thank you uh, Supervisor Wagon uh, <clears throat> just folks and I'm trying to not be redundant but uh, I really haven't heard anything I guess I disagree with today um, I recall comments early on when we started this process about another study to be done uh, upon which the county did nothing and I'm assuming that we're not going to do that so I'm assuming we're at the beginning of actually implementation of uh, uh, and development of a strategic plan so <clears throat> I look forward to uh, scheduling uh, some updates monitoring how we're doing focusing on Jack's comments about uh, picking the low-hanging fruit first but with a, uh, an eye on, on the longer term opportunity. And when I oftentimes hits me that uh, probably doesn't need to be said, it actually is something that does need to be said. So I, I just wanted to all of the people that are actually out there that have been participating, um, I, I really appreciate the candid and open conversation we had and, and the work uh, that was done. But I don't want anyone to think that that's been any kind of a criticism or should be interpreted harshly. We really need to get a better handle on all of, we have kind of an, an anomaly problem and there's a lot of good news here but we have an unusual circumstance and it looks to me uh, to be something that could be dramatically improved upon uh, if we all sort of think somewhat differently and tweak our operations somewhat but not in a huge way and it certainly not uh, shouldn't be construed as any kind of criticism of, of uh, all of the effort and energy that's gone forward over many years by several people. 
Supervisor Holmes. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. We have a lot of good programs in place now between St. Teresa's and Seventh-day Adventists, Salvation Army, the Gathering Inn. Uh, we're all doing, all of those organizations are doing good work to provide services for the homeless. But now we have a roadmap uh, to kind of bring all that together. And I think we need to take some of this and process it and put it into practice. That's my comment. Thank you. And the only thing that, that I will add is that um, there, um, there is a defined universe now. We much better understand the problem. Uh, and the clearly our greatest uh, ROI is going to be achieved in focusing on that particular slide that you have up there right now. Um, and, and that's where I think whatever we create by virtue of an infrastructure where the county plays an integral role is, is addressing that particular population. It seems that those folks that are a bit more transient in and out of homelessness, unfortunately, uh, more out than in uh, are being served by uh, the various existing temporary opportunities that they're able to find take advantage of during that temporary time of crisis and then move on clearly this population so having identified the population uh, it, it, it hopefully will be uh, easier for us um, having now qualified it to quantify it from a cost standpoint and then a deliverables standpoint and so uh, what I would encourage is the same expansive outreach that you engaged in putting together this report, you continue in putting together the strategy for addressing the situation so that we continue to embrace uh, the, the nonprofit sector the way that we have in putting together the report. Uh, and that I would encourage you uh, to at any point where you think you need direction from the board, whether it's because you've reached some kind of difference of opinion that has resulted in an impasse in terms of the plan that you want to bring forward, or it's identification of a budget-related item that you don't feel that you have appropriate authority to address, at any point as you're moving this forward that you reach a stumbling block like that, schedule a board item and come on back. Because this board, I think you've heard from all five of us, has a commitment to getting something down on paper that we can begin implementing in order to address that, that population right there. Any questions from staff or you would like any clarification on anything that you heard from us? Um, I'm going to restate what I understand and then maybe you can clarify. Um, I, think, um, I think we will go forward. Um, there's a lot of goodwill at the table, both within the county, but also in the nonprofit community. And hopefully we can develop interest at the city level also Precisely. to convene uh, work groups around all of these recommendations to look at developing more specifics, flush out the low-hanging fruit, come up with cost estimates, come up with schedules. And then when we have something similar, similar to what was done with the criminal justice master plan, and we can bring that back to you for your review and um, for your input on how you'd like us to continue to move forward. Yeah, and I think don't, again, I would just as chair emphasize, do not be concerned or afraid about checking back in with the board at any time where you think you need additional direction, uh, there might be a difference of opinion or any kind of a stumbling block that would get in your way from a budget standpoint, come back to the board and get direction. Understood, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Montgomery. Yeah, and I just want to follow up on Chairman Euler's comments on that. And even between coming back and talking to us at the board officially as a, as a public body in a public meeting, feel free to touch in with all five of us during the process just to make sure that we're, you're still kind of on board with what we thought we meant and what you thought we thought we meant, because it can be a little bit confusing in these particular conversations. Um, I've already had a really good suggestion submitted to me that I'll be following up on with you directly. Um, thank you, Pastor Dan. Um, and I think uh, I think there are some really low-hanging fruits that we can move on very quickly, even in advance of maybe having a sort of comprehensive strategic plan, particular things specific to the recommendations that Dr. Marbut made that we can move forward with 
really quickly. And I think that's going to be really showing our intent is making sure that the rubber really does hit the road here. So thank you. All right. Seeing no other comments from board members, thank you very much for the presentation. Dr. Marvin, thank you for your report. And I want to thank the members of the audience for participating in this conversation for your participation. Um, we're going to take uh, just a brief five minutes before we jump into the library item because I think the library item is going to take a little while as well. And I want to give board members a chance to stretch your legs, uh, as it were. Uh, so we will adjourn for five minutes, reconvene at 11.35.
All right, we will reconvene the meeting of the Placer County Board of Supervisors for April 7th. We continue today um, just a little bit late for our 10 10 timed item. A couple minutes uh, to receive an update on the Library Department strategic plan and budget related items. And so, Mary, if you would please. Sure. Um, good morning, Chairman Mueller, members of the board, Mr. Bosch, Mr. Carden, I'm Mary George, Director of Library Services. Andy Heath and I will present for your board this morning an update on both the library's fiscal and operational challenges. We will also outline the continued structural budgetary deficit in the library fund and the service results of that deficit. Andy will begin with the fiscal side of the house. Thank you, Mary. Uh, good morning, Chairman Mueller, members of the board. Uh, Andy Heath with the County Executive Office. What I'd like to do to preface this presentation for you today is have a conversation about what some of the fiscal challenges are that currently confront the library. Many of these fiscal challenges have previously been, been presented to your board as part of previous budget presentations um, and will not be new, but we will be updating the numbers with, with you today. Uh, just in bullet point format, some of the fiscal challenges. Uh, right now, the library uh, is dependent on the use of reserves to fund ongoing operations. Over the course of the last five completed fiscal years, the library has used on an average about $123,000 in reserves. Some years more than others, but over the course of five years, just about $600,000 in reserves have been used to fund ongoing library operations. Um, as a result, uh, the fund balance, uh, carryover fund balance total and reserves have been reduced by about 41% in that five-year period. Uh, it's gone from about $1.49 million uh, at the end of fiscal year 2008-09 uh, to 878,000 remaining in reserves at the end of fiscal year 2014, the year most recently completed. Uh, we have operating year-over-year -year, um, budgetary deficits uh, that have been projected um, for the current year and in the out years and in years past. Uh, this year we did uh, anticipate using a combination of carryover fund balance and reserves to the tune of about just over $400,000. So that $400,000 comes out of that $800,000 that remains uh, at, at the end of fiscal year 2013-14. Having said that, however, um, even though there is a $400,000 budgetary operating reserve, uh, that ne doesn't necessarily mean that in actuality when we finish fiscal year 14-15 that we will actually be there. And I'll show you a slide on that as well. Uh, there's continued reliance on dedicated property tax revenues. These are property taxes that are dedicated specifically for library services in Placer County as a primary revenue source. About 70% of all the revenues used by the library come from that property tax uh, to fund ongoing expenses. Right now, about 57 to 60%, depending on the year you look at, of all operating expenses are uh, for staff and benefits related costs. So the majority of those operating expenses are related to staff and benefits. And then the library has had a static budget since 2008. If you look at the budget for fiscal year 2007-8 and you compare it to the budget that for the current year, it's pretty much about the same. Uh, operating expenses um, have not increased uh, year over for, from one year to the other, and there's different reasons for that. But what that goes to is that the library has significantly uh, scaled back uh, on the expenditure level in response to primarily the recession that ensued in fiscal year 2008-9. And you'll see in the um, surplus and deficit slide uh, how that happened. Uh, moving on, these are the library's revenue sources uh, broken down by uh, major revenue type beginning with fiscal year 2005-2006. You can see that the, uh, the blue line, which, is re which represents that property tax, is about 70% of all library revenues that come in to the library fund. The property tax peaked in fiscal year 2008-9 uh, prior to the downturn in the economy and its impact on home values, thus impacting the amount of property tax that was received by not only the library fund but the general fund in the county. Uh, $4.12 million was received in 2008-9. Uh, up through fiscal year 2014, as we have projected budgetarily, uh, we're still not quite back at that number. We're getting closer as the economy continues to modestly recover, but we have not achieved that number yet uh, that we received in 2008-9. Also, if you look at the green bar, what the green bar represents is the uh, general fund, the discretionary funding that's provided to the library fund that is predominantly related to the co coverage of the uh, A87 or the indirect cost allocation, the indirect costs associated with running the library. Um, up until fiscal year 2008-9, the library um, 
was funded for 100% of those general fund A87 costs by the general fund. Um, and then in response to uh, trying to stabilize the amount of general fund contribution that was provided to the library uh, in fiscal year 2008-09, uh, all but $100,000 of the A87 costs were funded by the general fund for the library, and that, that process continues to this day. Uh, the little red bar that you see uh, that basically ended in fiscal year 2010-11 is related to state funding. Uh, after fiscal year 2010-11, the library uh, fund did not receive any state funding. And any state funding that we received to this day uh, since that time is primarily related to any grants that the library successfully receives uh, for specific purposes. The purple bar is all other revenue sources primarily made up of fines um, and uh, other types of revenues that come into the library um, over time. Looking at the, the budget surplus and deficit uh, for the library fund uh, since fiscal year 2005-2006, you can see that up through fiscal year 2008-09, the library was adding back its budgetary surpluses uh, into the library fund reserves and or fund balance. Uh, that amount, however, was decreasing uh, as the economy entered into a recession. And in 2009-10, the library began using those reserves uh, to maintain levels of service consistent with um, service delivery expectations. So in 2009-10 through 2000, basically projected through this year, the library almost every year uh, has a, uh, had a deficit in actuality for those years completed. And then we have a budgeted deficit for this year of $427,000 projected. Keeping in mind that this just rep represents a budgeted deficit. Um, it's what was required to balance the budget consistent with the levels of expenditures that were anticipated uh, in the budget itself. At this point in time, we anticipate that that deficit will be about $220,000 by the end of the year. Um, in, as the library responds to um, trying to mitigate the, the costs associated with, with running the library so as to not run a $420,000 deficit uh, for the entire fiscal year. That $51,539 surplus that was realized last year for fiscal year 2013-14 is primarily a result of um, uh, cutting expenditures again. Um, but more importantly, uh, looking at the A87 costs uh, and then adjusting those A87 costs consistent with doing a review of them that we did a comprehensive review last year where A87 costs to the library were reduced subsequent to the budget being adopted. However, the amount of funding um, was re remained consistent with what was anticipated as part of the approved final budget for 2013-14. That's pretty much a synopsis of kind of where the library is uh, in terms of um, the, the reserves, um, where we're at from an operational perspective. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mary to look at some of those operational challenges. Thank you, Andy. Currently, fiscal challenges in library's ongoing structural budgetary deficit have left the library's infrastructure deteriorating. The library is unable to effectively adjust to the constantly changing landscape of modern librarianship. What that means for your constituents is that there are fewer resources available to borrow from the libraries, longer waiting lists on popular materials, fewer open hours, fewer staff to assist patrons and to engage the communities, limited technology with no new formats offered like tablets or e-readers that can be borrowed from the libraries, and limited programming opportunities. So facilities have weakened and deferred maintenance and an aging infrastructure has left the library unable to refresh its 11 brick and mortar sites. Library users seek attractive, welcoming and convenient spaces for a positive library experience. Staffing has diminished, um, relying on extra help staffing for library services is no longer pragmatic or sustainable. Library administration is poised to make solid recommendations for the conversion of extra help to permanent staff. However, currently the conversion is based on both potential closures of libraries and a substantial ongoing general fund contribution. Public services have also suffered. The library system has insufficient resources to expand its hours into the evening or to add to its weekend hours. Expanded hours are needed to attract new users, including working families. Staffing levels are uncomfortably lean and existing staff need training to adjust to the complex ways which technology and traditional library services are currently intersecting. 
Open hours at the Auburn, Loomis, and Rockland libraries have been recently reduced and library materials need to be updated. Technology is also lagging and the library system is unable to introduce reliable self-service technology, provide trained staff to assist with complex technology interactions, or introduce innovative service delivery models. So you can see that we are um, having a difficult time addressing and moving into modern library services. The library's strategic plan and its three initiatives um, offer some hope for sustainability. The strategic plan was approved by your board in December of 2013. Um, it remains the document which library administration looks to for guidance in moving the library system towards sustainability. It has three initiatives. Initiative one, reverse the erosion in library services. By recognizing that like many county departments, the library was hit hard by the recession as the economy improves, the library must reinvest in its facilities, library materials, staffing, and programming in order to meet the expectations of library customers. To remain viable, the library must move beyond the interconnected system of small town libraries to become a fully interdependent network that shares and concentrates its resources and services where customers are using them. Initiative two, Modernize the operations to improve efficiencies and expand services by anticipating the needs of library users, reducing the unit cost of routine customer transactions, improving the library's website content, providing access while making self-service easy, fun, and preferred by customers with up-to-date wireless technology and equipment. And finally, the third initiative to build capacity for the future and achieve fiscal sustainability by analyzing all the potential funding streams, establishing and maintaining prudent reserves, and developing budgets that can support efforts to reverse erosion and modernize operations. Library administration continues to pursue opportunities to support these initiatives while listening to citizens in both the Loomis and Meta Vista communities and in meetings with stakeholders Several sustainability options have been identified and discussed, including but not limited to reduce cost drivers by reimagining the library system, delivering modern services with fewer libraries, seek new revenue sources in the form of a parcel tax or partnerships with other agencies, increase the county contribution. We've estimated that shoring up existing services could be around 500,000 annually or invest in an improved modern system estimated at one to two million annually. We know we must discontinue the use of reserves to fund ongoing services, and we know that continuing the status quo with, will equal continued erosion of services and library materials. In conclusion, as we move forward towards sustainability, thanks, Sandy. I'd like to talk about how we may focus and I offer these points. Let's think of the library as an infrastructure or a library system, and not just as an individual institution or town library. Let's think about the possibility of the library as a vital contributor to the economic development and health of the Placer County community, a great return on investment, and not just an altruistic endeavor. Let's think about the library as a modern system, meaning transforming and adapting to the changes in how library services are delivered, how customers are using the library, and how best to succeed in this new environment. And finally, let's honor the rich and proud history of the library system, but not allow that history to hold the library back from investigating different ways of delivering future services. I'd like to thank my staff, each and every one of them, in every library in all those 11 brick and mortar sites and our bookmobile driver. I'd like to um, introduce my administrative team behind me, Kelly Heikola and Assistant Director Joanne Collins. And I'd like to thank the numerous friends who have hung out this morning and waited to be heard by your board. All right, that concludes staff's presentation at this point. We'll go ahead and see if there are any questions or comments by board members before we open it up to uh, public comment. Any members of the board wish to address Supervisor Montgomery? Um, can we go back to the slide about the possible funding options? Sustainability options, sorry, <laughs> not funding. Um, 
I've heard a, a lot of these same suggestions from, from folks. Um, and I think um, it's a little bit of deja vu because <laughs> we just heard it with the homelessness presentation. Mm -hmm. um, we are having the same conversation about fire services in Placer County and so many other services. Um, and I guess my question, because I'm going to wait to opine on any of this, I guess my question is, is what is our what would our first choice be if we could choose any of these options moving forward? Because just as some background, the, the, the shoring up existing levels of services at $500,000 a year roughly doesn't get us any improvement. It, it keeps things exactly as they are now. We don't have a single additional book in there. We don't have any extra library hours. Um, and every year it's going to cost us a little bit more because every year it's just incrementally more. Um, so, you know, that's certainly a request that this board could undertake, but it wouldn't actually get us anywhere that we want to, I think, get as, as communities. Um, and so, f for me, it's almost not a fiscal discussion, it's a policy discussion. It's a question of what are our priorities. Are they, again, like I said, during the homelessness conversation, is it providing services to the homeless folks? Is it roads? Is it libraries? Is it public safety? Is it elections. Um, so if, if, if you could figure out the best of these choices, what would your advice be to us? I know I'm putting you on the spot. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I know you've also given this a huge amount of thought. Um, I feel very confident that I've given you my best recommendation. That recommendation has been controversial. And I've been out there in the community trying to explain um, the, the best way I can mm -hmm. for that recommendation. And, and that recommendation is that is to reimagine our libraries with fewer delivery points. So pulling back in, sort of pruning the rose bush in order to let it flower more. Yes, ma'am. To use a terrible metaphor, sorry. OK, thank you. That's, that's my only question for now. I just, you know. The dollars are critically important to us and to everybody else since these are public dollars. They're taxpayer dollars, property tax. Um, and I will have some comments on this slide later. Any other member of the board wish to address this prior to us opening public comment? Mr. Yeah, Wigand. Kirk, um, just roughly looking at the numbers, <clears throat> quickly looking at them, I should say. Uh, 2005 6. If I did these calculations quickly, look like uh, general fund contribution to the total library budget was about 19 percent. Yeah, that slide. And then last year uh, looks like it popped up to 24 percent. So obviously uh, it's clear that that's a trend that. Um, yeah, it's gone from about 19.1 percent in 2005-06 to 24 percent in 2013-14. Not bad. Um, and obviously, uh, I think one of the clear tr trends is that, uh, or issues is that we're tr trying to not continue that trend for obvious reasons, have more and more proportion of the general fund uh, supplant the library budget. But is there any, uh, what's been the basis for, the, for determining the amount of general fund contribution? The basis for determining the amount of general fund contribution today and for the last several years has been funding all of the 87 costs, uh, whatever that amount is, less $100,000, where the $100,000 came into play in response to addressing uh, discretionary revenue, declining discretionary revenue sources uh, across the county. And that the library, uh, like other county operations, would pay a portion of those costs um, as general fund revenues decline, basically. Um, and then with that A87 cost, less $100,000, the general fund also covers the um, cost for the uh, county librarian, the salary cost, salary and benefit cost. And so in the proposed, what, just for the, what is the percent proposed, the percent of the general fund of the library total fund uh, proposed for 1415? What is the percent of? Yeah, we've been from 19 to 24%. So what's this, what's the proposal in the next year? For, for this year? Yeah. For, for 15-16? Yeah. Um, 
to, uh, the proposal that currently resides in the budget is to cover all that. No, but what's the percentage of the total library budget of the general fund contribution, if you have that handy? Uh, I don't have that number. Um, That's okay. I can. Million twenty one into six million, so about 17%. <laughs> 17 percent. Seventeen percent. Thanks. All right. Seeing no other uh, comments by board members at this time, we'll go ahead and open public comment. Anybody who wishes to address the board on this item, please go ahead and step forward. Uh, please uh, state your name and uh, try to keep your comments to three minutes. Good morning or afternoon. Hi, I'm Rosalie Wolfram. I'm here representing Placer County Democratic Central Committee. Uh, I wrote a few things. Uh, on March 10th, over 200 people attended the Loomis Town Hall meeting to save our beloved Loomis Library. Many of our members were in attendance that night. Because of budget restraints, a recommendation to close the Loomis and Meta Vista libraries was made. Seemingly, this was the only solution to keep the library system viable. We would urge you to find another solution. Our libraries are integral parts of the communities in which they are located. The citizens use the libraries not only to borrow books, but to avail themselves of various programs offered. Com computers are on site for the benefit of everyone, from school children who may need them to complete term papers to adults looking for jobs. Tax preparation services by the AARP are conducted at these facilities also. Various club meetings are conducted at the libraries, including ours. They are places where people feel safe to congregate, both morning hours and evenings. Also, the Loomis Library facility is used as a heating and cooling shelter for residents during extreme weather uh, events. Our libraries have been operating on what I would call a shoestring budget for years augmented by a myriad number of volunteers, such as the Friends of the Library, of which I am a member also, and by the bi-monthly used book sales. We realize cuts to the budget may be necessary, but our feeling is that our library should be given a little bit more of the pie to work with. According to the proposed budget, and I hope I have this right, Proposed budget of for, uh, fiscal year 214 to 15, totaling a bit over 792 million. The county libraries are allocated just 0.007 percent, a little over 5.8 million. This is a reduction of 7.3 percent from the previous year's budget allocation. We urge you to really listen to all the speakers today, hear the passion in their voices, and make the right decision. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I know that this is something that uh, a number of the supervisors have paid very close attention to because um, this is an issue that will affect every one of your districts as we go forward. First of all, to introduce myself, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dave Wheeler. I sit on the Loomis Town Council. I look at the uh, proposals up here, and these proposals are based solely on the numbers and I can tell you financially uh, the whole library system does not make financial sense. It doesn't make financial sense. It's very simple if you look at the amount of savings that you're going to achieve by getting and closing the Loomis and Mena Vista Library you're talking about that one year budget deficit that they're into. So what's next? The next one of the branches are going to close. The county, has, as a history, has put their money into three magnet libraries, and uh, you kind of look at that and say, okay, where does Loomis fit into that magnet library system? There are three magnet libraries. Uh, your cost per circulation by branch, which I found was very surprisingly high, the average cost per circulation is $5.41. The three mega libraries are below that. Loomis is the most efficient outside of the three mega libraries, uh, charging just a cost of uh, 496 per circulation. If you look at the dollars and cents of the square footage, the Loomis Library is the fourth largest 
library in the system. If you look at the circulation, then the circulation model is the Loomis Library is the fifth busiest and Meta Vista is the sixth busiest. If you look at the alternatives for services, you look at the Bookmobile is the most expensive service at $7.25 uh, per circulation. If you look at the self-service model that's being tried in uh, Penryn, uh, that cost per circulation is uh, $6.57 per circulation, so that's not the most effective way as well. I understand the library system is in dire straits. I get that. But closing these two libraries with such short notice and not giving a look at a 10-year plan and beyond is akin to putting a Band-Aid on a severed limb. The Band-Aid's gonna bleed through and you're still gonna bleed to death within a very short period of time. You haven't solved the problem. If there's any kind of funding consideration, the funding consideration needs to be system-wide. Yes, there's a number of people here from Loomis who said that they would be willing to pay more money. It's gotta be system-wide. It's a system-wide problem and it needs to be addressed system-wide. So financially, your libraries don't make sense whatsoever. You have to decide what is the purpose of the library and what does it do for a community. I look at the Loomis Library as very much a part of our community. Our community is on the cusp of growing within walking distance of that library. For Loomis, it would be huge. We're looking at an additional 400 additional living units uh, within walking distance, virtually right next door to the current library. Closing this library at this point in time, I don't think is going to get you a long-term problem. I can go down this list, I can tell you where your next closures are going to be in two years, three years, four years, and five years. What really needs to be identified is what's the purpose of the libraries and what are you going to do with them 10 years from now. So good luck with that. I've told Mary George this. If the libraries were on fire, I'd know exactly what to do. How to, <laughs> how to keep them open would be another story. So good luck to you on this one. I see the clock started ticking, but I haven't started speaking. <laughs> anyway, my name is Susan Taubman. I live in Loomis, 6500 Dell Place. I went to the past two meetings in Loomis, and now I consider this more a system-wide issue. I want to point out that in California, students continue to score near the bottom among all states in the United States. By the fourth grade, California is 47th in the nation in both math and reading. Eighth graders ranked 45th in math and 42nd in reading. That makes us, by the fourth grade, one of the three states out of 50 in the U.S. with the lowest reading scores. By the eighth grade, we're one of the eight lowest states with reading scores. Um, in a 2013 uh, study, it showed only 33% of fourth graders are proficient in math. Only 27% of fourth graders are proficient in reading. By the eighth grade, 28% of eighth graders are proficient in math. Only 29% of eighth graders are proficient or better in reading. By the way, we need libraries to help bolster their education. Uh, school districts have had cuts as well, and libraries need to fill that gap. International test scores also show low rankings for the whole U.S. According to the 2012 Program for International Student Assessment, scores show that teenagers in the U.S. slipped in all rankings, math, science, and reading. U.S. teenagers slipped from 25th place to 31st place, in science from 20th to 24th place, in reading from 11th place to 24th place. Now, the top scores come from Shanghai, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, Macau, Japan, Liechtenstein, and I asked myself, where the heck is that? Looked it up, 62 miles, a 62 square mile population uh, uh, in geography and with a population of 35,000. Then Switzerland, the Netherlands, and Estonia, and there's even more countries that are above us in achievement. Now, we have to remedy this situation, and therefore I also contest what the library says, that it uh, just should be viewed as a corporate investment. 
Now, the answer to that is no. Now, some solutions. One, I can cite something that my own father did. He was on the committee to save Carnegie Hall in New York City, and that was done through petitions and through finding, um, you know, getting petitions and being on, forming a committee and um, eventually getting New York City to provide $5 million to purchase the concert hall. Now, I do have, I'm going to run out in a second, I'll run out of time, so I feel that it's only a stopgap measure to close the Loomis Library and others. I want to point out, I looked on the, um, on the internet, saw that the Santa Cruz Library raised $5,000 just from Scrabble tournaments. So there are lots of things that nobody's thinking about, um, but you can do a little research online, find ways to have spelling bees, etc. I've thought of having <coughs> a Pony Express type relay with bicyclists going from branch to branch, and yes, all branches should be involved and don't prune it like an old rose tree. Get um, runners, joggers, motorbikes, cars, and go from, in fact, on one day, have a barbecue in every single branch and, and link them together as if it were a relay and raise funds for the entire county system. And do think out of the box. Don't just write the system off. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Sarah Vassallo Gardner. I'm 16 years old and I live at 8050 King Road, Loomis, California. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody who's been a part of this process and um, I want to thank all the friends of the library who have supported, supported us and supported our library. And um, I've been to every town meeting and I just really want to make my point that we need to go back to the drawing board here. This is not the answer, okay? Like Mr. Wheeler was saying, in two years, we're gonna be in the exact same position. What library are we gonna close next? This, this is not the answer. We, we need fundraisers, we need, we need people to stand up and give their opinion and say, we're, we're not gonna stand for this. The, the people have spoken and this is not the way to go. Um, I, I feel so blessed to live in a country where I can do this, where I can stand up and give my opinion. And I, I thank God that all these fine people are here to do the same. And thank you all for the part that you play in this. And I hope you will make the right decision. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon again, CJ Jawaka from Roseville, 1568 Morning Glory Lane for the record. I'm looking at the chart up, up there. Um, I do see a reduced uh, contribution from the general funds, approximately 427,000, that's what's been told. That's very interesting. Considering 800 million budget uh, of the Plaza County, we are unable to find uh, 400,000 to keep this library going, considering the property tax almost remains the same. Now, I. I definitely resonate with everybody talked before me, especially Councilman Wheeler. We can talk on and on, on and on about the finance, the data. Let me just touch upon a culture, okay? The libraries are the reflection of our culture. I grew up a part of the world where we had a different culture. When two kings fought, you know what? The the king who won would do the first thing to destroy the, civil, the culture aspect of the uh, community, of the society. The first target used to be, trust me, libraries. The libraries who are there for thousands and thousands of years would be targeted first because that is what carried the culture, the people to the next generations. And the second would be their worship places and, and their the civilization, the reflection, what have you, right? So having said that, um, I can't agree enough with my previous speakers. Please um, save this. Let us look like enablers, not like an invaders into our own communities. Thank you so much. Ramona Brockman, uh, 4060 Ridge Drive, Loomis, California. Um, 
as I've been hearing these discussions, I, I find the same and, and agree with them all. Um, I, I think closing libraries is just the easiest way out. And as I've been trying to grapple with this issue, uh, I've attended the other meetings, I, I have uh, some comments and questions to ask because um, I've been really trying to understand the rationale of, of closing the libraries. Um, I've researched California library laws, state and national standards, and other library systems in California and found no convincing reason to support the proposed closures. For instance, according to state law, public libraries are considered an extension of the K-12 through education system. So why close a library within walking distance to three Loomis schools or any other library bench for that matter, especially given the abysmal statistics from my previous speaker? Um, and there's some further statistics to ponder. Again, we might get overloaded in statistics, but I think these are very important because it does have to deal with the culture and, and the value of libraries that it doesn't seem even our county or, for that matter, part of the st whole state of California gets. The National Library standard for space is one square foot per capita. State standards are 0.5 square foot per capita. Placer County is currently, with its all branches, 0.34 square feet per capita. You close down, and Loomis was the fourth largest library, you close these down, look at how small your square footage is. I seriously doubt if you can really service this population with only three magnet libraries without having detrimental effects and further erosion of services. Um, as well as uh, the budget, let's take a look at some budget realities. National mean library expenditure or their budget is $46.52 spent per capita. State mean is $32.36 spent per capita. Placer County is left at $29.44 per capita. Again, the funding is a big deal, but it's a matter of priorities. Where are you going to fund, and what are you going to fund, and what are you going to encourage in this county? Um, so how could a county residents benefit from closures when our libraries are currently below state and national standards? How can we be faced with library closures when we are the eighth wealthiest county in the state? How are our tax dollars being spent? Um, even you know, questioning all these expenditures and, and where's the money going? Out of f recent Friends of the Library meeting, we were told that the library department will be hiring new trained library staff to replace the extra help who lost their jobs when their hours were cut. These new hires have higher salaries. Where is this extra money coming from if the department is already using its reserves? I think the whole system needs to be looked at in a very completely different way. Um, some solutions, I guess since these are all negative marks, what are some solutions or that I could question? It, just real quick is um, shared expenditures. Rockland is now at 60, uh, almost 60,000 people. And that Rockland Library Service is a large incorporated city. I think we need to look at a new structure of our library county system to involve city and county cooperation uh, and that all cities have a say in how the library is run as well as looking at other cost savings measures like the Loomis uh, Union School District did saving uh, I think it was six million dollars with installing solar on their facilities why can't this county do something similar and invest into their future of cost savings when it comes to doing something as simple as solar on top of rooftops and parking spaces. Thank you. Quick question, ma'am, before you <clears throat> walk away. The, the statistics you were citing, where did you get those the, uh, in terms of the standards, national standards? Standards, um, I can no. provide them to you. Uh, they were curious, all- Where are you found? Uh, American Library Association. Um, I've also researched the Santa Barbara City County Library System that's combined county city. So it was based off some of their national standards that they've quoted. So on their websites? So it's on their websites and the American Library Association, yes. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Kathleen Edwards, 444 Nevada Street, Auburn, California. I'm president of the Friends of the Library of Auburn. I'm a supporter of all our library system, and I'm an evangelist for our library system. As Dr. Seuss's book says about I speak for the trees, I speak for your constituents. Right now, I want you to know that your constituents really want additional funding for, your library, for our library system. We're on a campaign in the Auburn Friends of the Library because we care. And so we've had over 500 members, and we decided that's not enough because we want you to know that people really care. We're up to 640 members right now. 
And it's, um, these are people who are willing to give their money to the library. And this is to the library system. We're not just for Auburn. We're for the whole Placer County library system. And we want you to know that I am here today to implore you to please consider additional funding for our library system. Um, we can't just do it with bake sales, and we do a lot with that type of fundraising. But that's, that's not what the solution is, and we all know that. I want you to know how much the library means to your constituents, to the children, to the school children, to the folks who come into the library who have lack many, many resources that many of us are blessed to have that are dependent on the library system for these basic needs. And when we were listening for that hour and a half about the homeless, I was thinking, the libraries are a safe haven for the homeless also. Not all can reach the library, but if you go in the libraries yourself, you'll see attest to that, that they are there too. So I do speak for your constituents and ask you to please consider that the libraries be considered a critical part of our county, along with fire, police, safety, mental health. Please consider the libraries on an equal basis and increase our funding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Walt Shear. I live in Loomis, California. And as I sat in the back here, I I just can't imagine how uh, I, I want to thank you guys for your service because I can't imagine how I sat through so many of these meetings. <laughs> Honest to God. But down to the brass tax. You know, the crisis that we're dealing with today, the financial crisis, it jumps right out at you that there's a reduction from the general fund contributions of $400,000. Um, that's that doesn't take a cray computer to put that together. But at the same time, you just heard in your presentation the preferred alternative is to start closing libraries and for you guys to increase your contributions to $2 million. We'd like to close down some libraries. We can't afford the Volkswagen we're driving, but we'd like to have a Rolls Royce. That's what I've heard here today. Now, in the staff report on this, there's a couple of things that are really important. And that is that, first of all, it's really important that the communities be involved in coming up with the solution. The other thing is that closing the libraries isn't going to solve your, your fiscal problem. And in the end, you're going to need more money through various sources. And what I'm asking for is that you give the community the time to come up with a real plan that will keep the libraries open and be a model to apply to other libraries as you go through this so solution to keeping our libraries open is what people are asking for. Now, the common sense says if you close the library, you're going to save money. But in fact, when you look at the operation of the Loomis Library, if you close that library, you'll create a $15,000 drag on your budget. You won't save money. It will cost you money. And so I ask you, please don't close this library today. And that comes from looking at the revenues, the tax revenues and the operational revenues, and the amount of money that you're losing or spending, excess spending at that particular branch would be about $42,000. I've been told that nobody's going to be fired. And so if you close that library and you continue your ongoing salary costs, $57,000, without any recovery from the Loomis Library, it's going to cost you $15,000 more in your budget. So it seems like the smart move would be to close the library when, in fact, the smart move is to keep it open and empower the community to come up with the solution. And that, my friends, is all we're asking for. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Lisa Golden. I live in Loomis. And this was actually why I came up for the <laughs> to this meeting. But I'm glad I was here for the earlier. It's very enlightening. And again, thank you for your consideration in all these matters. I, 
I can't imagine being briefed on all these and sitting through this. Uh, I appreciate you very much. And um, I also appreciate your presentation and uh, letting us know what it is uh, a little bit more clearly. It came for me as I was looking uh, and reading uh, what you wrote in the strategic plan initiatives, saying that uh, you had one as reverse erosion and two modernize and three build capacity for the future which I think is a good plan however how that's implemented I think it's a matter of opinion and subjective um, but I am confused for reverse erosion, would that be something that you would do first, or was it just listed as number one? Ma'am, you need to address your comments to the board. Oh, I can't. I can't ask her no, that. You okay. Need to address your comments to the board. I apologize. I was not aware that I could not ask questions. You can ask questions to the board. Okay. Um, so, is it your understanding that reversing erosion is um, number one in the plan, or is it just that's how they were ordered? Continue with your comments. We'll get answers for you to each of your questions. Okay. And I'm sorry, I'm kind of new at this. Right. Okay, and, and if that's correct, then has there been a bookmobile that was already purchased? And I mean, I'm not a financial expert, but I know in my own personal budget and running my home, you don't go out and make a big purchase before you secure your funds. And um, with all due respect, I think when you have people in those positions making those kinds of decisions and maybe not even going out and making the full plan known of closing libraries until maybe a month before they're supposed to happen. I think it's just that those communities be given proper time to have a say and to come up with a plan. I think that's what we're asking. Thank you so much. And again, I apologize. No, that's right. I'm, we'll get, we'll I, I am a homeschooling mom, by the way. My daughter is here. And I, too, am very grateful for this opportunity to teach her this process. We're going through the um, uh, government and branches of government. And this is a great opportunity. She has written you a letter. Um, I'm more of the speaker. She's more of the reader, which is why this is important to her as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon, members of the uh, Board of Supervisors. I'm Miguel Yukovich. I live in Loomis, and as you all know, I've been on the council for a long period of time. A um, couple comments. First, there's a wonderful article in Western Cities that seems very appropriate. And so it talks about how libraries build communities. And contrary to what the library, chief librarian said, it's not the trend to close libraries but it's the trend to make them more effective and provide the services for the community because they are, as they pointed out, the town, let me have down here, um, excuse me, town square of most communities, and that's true in Loomis. And two of the previous uh, speakers, Mr. Shearer and Mr. Uh, and Dave, talked about all the values, and I'm not going to talk about them again, of the Loomis Library. If you were franchise operators, you wouldn't close down one of your best franchises. So I'm sure you won't close down the Loomis Library for that reason. A couple of points I want to bring up is a little bit of the questions I have about how finances have been shown um, based about the library. If you look at the library revenues for 2014-15, I guess from the property taxes, four million. If you read the report for the county, the property taxes are going to go up seven and a half percent. So there'll be an extra what two hundred. $80,000 next year based just on property taxes that you will receive. One of the other things I want to point out that you might want to think of as franchise owners, what your company did was you took part-time people and made them full-time people. And that cost you a lot of money. A couple years ago and I asked why this was done, I was told because part-time people aren't that good. But now you're paying PERS, retirement and health benefits about an additional 30 or 40 percent cost to operate the libraries. I really question, why, why are we doing that? Your libraries probably could run on their own. And what I'm asking, would you like, please ask you to do, I'll get this out yet. Oh, I got a whole time, I'm not gonna use it all, folks. Is let's all meet and get together and see what we can do. I was a little bit concerned when 
Supervisor Montgomery said, what, what were the options? One of them is, let's get together with the people and see if we're willing to pay more. But that was not an option that the... Actually, that was on there. No, no, I know. When you asked the head librarian, that wasn't her first choice. So, uh, so let's get together and let's meet. But look at some of your financial figures. Uh, they're way out of whack. They're, they're not true. And I asked one time, how do you get a reserve? And the way they got the reserves is every year they got so much of a budget. If they didn't spend it, that went into the reserves. And that's fine, and that's what reserves are to be used for. But you'll see now that uh, you'll be building up in the next coming years more money for libraries just from the property tax. Thank you. Oh, I made it. You use all your time, Miguel. Hello. I'm glad to be here. My name is Lorna Ingram. I live in Penryn. Uh, I'm pretty well representing as one of the friends of the Loomis Library. And we have a small group of friends of the library here, but we have 2,700 people that are here and can't be in place right now. And that's grown-ups. Multiply that by their families or their relatives and their children. And you've got a huge group of people that want to keep the interconnection of the libraries we have in this county so that each library, small or big, is important. And our library is important to us. Our Loomis Library is very important to us. But every single library is important in its own place. And your job, our job, is to build that up, strengthen it, give it vitality, and make it grow with the um, times and grow with the, what's needed for our children to be educationally on top instead of in lower ranks according to some of these worldwide figures. We can do it. You can do it. We can work together. You've got the support of a lot of people in this little situation that is big enough for this community. And you can, we can work together and do it. I want to be a part of that. Does this go to the clerk? Yeah, to the clerk of the board. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Linda Sandal. Uh, I've lived in Gloucester County for 62 years. Um, I am a officer of the Friends of the Library. I've used the Applegate Library. Four generations of our family have gone from Applegate Library to Colfax in grammar school and high school. And we have lo used Loomis for many, many years. And I have moved back to Loomis. Um, the Friends of the Library got together with some of our Loomis uh, people. And they know who they are. Um, and I would like to read a letter that we forth to your, I think, your packet or whatever you carry with the supervisor meetings. And I will go ahead and read it. Um, the Friends of the Loomis Library are proposing that Placer County keep the library open for an additional year. We plan on implementing the following steps immediately upon the county's decision to grant our proposal. The town and the friends of the Luma, of the of the excuse me the town and the friends of the library will develop a strategic plan for operating the Loomis Library to sustain optimum consistency with a strategic plan from the county. This plan will have measurable metrics, which we will be able to be compiled by a committee appointed to the town by the town council comprised of members from the Friends of the Li Library, the development of the community, the Chamber of Commerce, the Horseshoe Bar Mac, one council member, the town manager, and a representative from the school libraries. The task will include, but not be limited to, the review the county strategic plan, review the specific operation of the Loomis Library, identify and survey the Loomis Library service community, compile operational efficiencies, sources and use of funds and goals and policies with specific implemental schedules. The strategic plan will be finalized for implementation within the additional year requested. 
funding resource uh, funding sources will be established through co commitments from the town of Loomis, friends of the library, and other dedicated parties and possible grants. We are committed to save our library. We know time and money is precious. It is, a crucial, it is crucial that we collaborate with a plan to support a fix that will achieve a positive impact to this problem and allow our communities to support the fiscal process. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other folks that wish to speak? If so, if you go ahead and start lining up, that'd be great. So we get an idea of how many folks are looking at her. <clears throat> Ready? Uh, Jean Wilson from Loomis. I'm also on the Loomis Planning Commission and a member of Friends of the Library. And I'm sorry that this has come to you at such an unfortunate time of the year because I know that you are preparing your next year's life uh, budget for the county and that's not an easy job. And it has certainly come as a shock to Loomis to have this come to us now that libraries in imminent danger of closing because there was nothing in the past that would lead us to think that was so. The strategic plan that you passed says that there would be analysis of staffing to effectively deliver fiscally prudent services to all branches, which would lead us to think our, all branches included Loomis. In addition, the notes to the library budget that you, uh, the final budget that you passed last September stated that the fiscal year 2014-15 proposed budget for the library maintains the existing level of program services, which would again lead us to think that we were going to be having our program services continued, including the Loomis Library. So it was a huge shock to find out at the very end of, of February that our branch was scheduled to close. I think that we deserve some extra time to figure something out and to look at all the proposals that could be made. I realize that you're under constraints time-wise, but we need some time because this really was sprung on us very, very quickly. As was mentioned, the library um, service is not just the current population of our town, but the immediate area surrounding two to three sides of the library is an open space that has had a proposal for housing development that came to us originally about 2005, and because of the recession, it was shelved like many, many other projects, but it is now back before us. This project will include perhaps 500 homes. It includes the density zoned for our affordable housing uh, that we're required to do. And that is, I uh, believe, something like 184 units, I, I think. Uh, we have a lot of people moving not at the edge of town, not five miles away, not a mile away. We have people moving into the area immediately next to the library. No closer could these people get than to be there. Please take that into account. The strategic plan says that library use is population driven and we will have that much more library population. The strategic plan also calls for evaluating all alternatives and I ask you to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman Euler, members of the board, uh, executive staff, Rick Angelosi, town manager of Loomis. I know some of you are anxious to move on to lunch and it's been dragging on. I wish you could have been at our March 10th meeting where uh, it was very Norman Rockwell, as one of our council members said. We had 200 people in a 60 room capacity uh, building with them outside, windows open, speakers everywhere. Um, Good thing there wasn't a fire marshal there. Uh, yeah, well, uh, retired. Um, uh, S Supervisor Holmes was there, very, very uh, 
bravely so. Uh, this is a passionate issue. I think the issue before you today, and thank you very much for your stay of execution uh, by not making a decision today, but I think before you is process, the fully vetting of this. Uh, what concerns me as a public servant the most is that going right up to our March 10th meeting, it was we're reducing hours, we're reducing hours. All of a sudden it's, oh, yeah, I kind of goofed. We're going to recommend your closure. Uh, but we weren't going to tell you until your March 10th meeting. That's kind of a, a slap upside the head if you want to look at partnerships. I think you need to fully vet this. You need to allow the communities to work on it. You're going to have tough, tough decisions this May and June. I read the article where we're in the worst fire, wildfire situation that can happen, and Cal Fire wants a 21% increase. What are you going to do when they want to close over? That's going to be a tough decision. You're going to have many, many tough decisions. Allow us some time to help you come up with a resolution to this issue and fully vet it. That's all we're asking for, and that's what the community is. 2,500 signatures, that's pretty amazing. Supervisor Holmes has a question for you. Yes, right thank you for your comments. I just want to let you know that the stay of execution was for us. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that, thank you. I'm Eleanor Petesky. I live in Newcastle, and I'm a member of the Friends of the Library. And my position is I see no good reason for closing a library. And there seems to be, I had planned to just come and speak concerning the DeWitt property today, but I ended up staying because it was so interesting. The homeless situation, the library situation, and there seems to be a theme in all of this. And it's that people want to help make those decisions and figure out what is best. Uh, Kevin Hanley from the Chamber of Commerce in Auburn was even saying, let's get the city and, and uh, county to work together on behalf of their constituents. And I think this is just the way of the future. And I think the whole theme of today's comments and problems comes back to get the city, county working together. This is true for DeWitt. And, you know, uh, you don't need to, t to throw the seniors and the theater out uh, yet because there really isn't a plan that community has been involved in that they've agreed to. So it's right across the whole thing. It is a, a way that things are being done that aren't including the constituents. And a lot of people in this area are extremely talented. They bring a lot to the table and they can help. They can help in so many ways. So I, my thing today as I leave is let's get everybody involved and come up with better solutions for all these problems and all these situations that have been discussed today. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, I'm seeing three more people that are standing at this point. Is there anybody else that's going to want to address the board? Um, Yuri Mappa. I, Gary, before you speak, um, by hook or by crook, at 1 o'clock, we're going to shut off public comment. So let's go ahead uh, with anybody else that wants to uh, address the board. Go ahead and get in line, and we'll try to get everybody in by 1 o'clock. How's that? Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Gary Mappa, Applegate. I've been using Placer County Libraries since 1960. 55 years later, I find myself going to the Auburn Library on Mondays, and it's a slap in the face that reminds me I'm reaching the age where I'm forgetting, because it's closed on Mondays. <laughs> and that's an issue that I tend to forget about, drive in, and all of a sudden slap in the face. The libraries to me are Americana, hot dog, apple pie, baseball. It's a sacred uh, place, sacred institution, and it's one of those things that I regret being here to even hear it's being discussed. If you look at the charts, you'll see 2005, progressively the blue lines increase. 
until 2008. And we've gone through, what, maybe three years of real financial suffering. Now the blue charts from 2000, say 12, to 2014 show an increase. So according to what I'm being told by government, things are great. The economy is great. Now if you project, like I think it was Miguel made the statement, there's going to be a 7% tax increase. I think you should take advantage of the projected growth that we're being told is going to happen and give the libraries a chance to do what the group here has been talking about is a chance to step up and put their groups together and keep things just like they are but we have a chance to really study what's going on. The next item I'd like to bring up is we're talking about projecting things out into the future. I'd really like to know what's the projection on the Middle Fork funds that supposedly will be coming to the county as a result of the PG&E acquisition that's going to be shared with the county and with Placer County PCWA. You don't hear anything about that anymore. For a long time it was a big hype that there was going to be a tremendous amount of money coming. And I do know there's going to be extraordinary expenses to maintain the system, to implement it and put it in order. But I'd like to see a projection in the next six months or a year a report from staff telling us what's the actual projection and what's the most recent update so we know what's going on with the Middle Fork funds. Is the Middle Fork funding in jeopardy or can we be optimistic that we're going to have additional funds coming to the county that will be at the discretion of the board to use for other expenses? Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Otten, and I'm the Vice Chairman of the Placer County Library Advisory Board. And um, this, this morning I enjoyed listening to the County Executive uh, speaking to the uh, Chamber Forum and talking about what a great job Placer County has done and that other counties are looking to us. And I think by going forward with this action, it'll be a reversal of fortunes for Placer County in that our libraries are the heart and soul of our communities. They are where dem democracy really, it, it, it's the most democratic of all our institutions as a library. It's in, when we started the Carnegie Libraries, there was the emphasis is on the, the public. It's a public library. It's not a business. It's a public library. It's for the people, by the people, and not for the government and by the government. And we've had this ERAF problem for a long time. And all of a sudden, we re wake up and realize, well, we got, really got this ERAF problem. We can't fund it. Well, I think there are ways to to do that. And I think if you listen to to your constituents, I think we can find a way. And I would join with my friends in Loomis to ask for a reprieve and see if we can find some better ways to fund this, maybe even creating a blue ribbon commission of the public to come up with some better solutions than just to close our libraries, uh, and uh, David mentioned this morning how diverse our county is. Well, the, the, to find out how diverse it is, just go visit our libraries. There, if you want to find out about the history of Loomis, you want to find out what Loomis is like, you go to the library. And each of our communities is the same way, where you go up to Tahoe and I've been in all the libraries in the county, and uh, they each have their own character, their own smell, and so, you know some and and some worse than others. Yeah, yeah. Well, some better, but it, it has that feeling of comfort of home, it, and it's a place where people are energized and where thoughts and uh, 
are able to soar and we were able to find solutions. Susan Hildreth, who was, became the top librarian in the country, you know, she, she contended that our libraries are our community living room. Well, the current state librarian, he refers to them as a place of more like the kitchen where creativity takes place. And uh, so let's get that creativity to work and uh, find some good solutions because we want to boost the image of Placer County. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Step on four, please. Good afternoon. My name is Susan Rushton, and I am a lifetime English major, among other things. I'm a, also a lifetime supporter of the libraries. And I just have a question. It seemed ironic to me today that the, the, one, of the, one of the other major subjects you're talking about, we, we, we talked about, you talked about, was homelessness in Placer County. And now we're talking about funding for the libraries. My question is, I'd like us all to consider the possibility of a connection between the increase in homelessness in Placer County and the decrease in library funding. Of course I would ask this. Of course I would promote library funding because, I, as I said, I'm a lifetime English major. But is it really one or the other? Do we help the homeless and close the libraries? Because and my quest, my focus is, my idea is the library provides a place for Im the improval, improvement of literacy, which is, in my opinion, part of the problem of homelessness. And if we d decrease the, 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 pos the, the ability of people to become literate, we increase the possibility of someone becoming homeless. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jenny Nisley. Um, I live in Loomis, California. I uh, went to Loomis School and graduated from Del Oro. I'm the current executive director for the Loomis Chamber. <clears throat> and I'm just here to ask for more time. This came on so sudden and we will all work together, the town, the nonprofits, all of us will work together, but I'm here just to ask for more time. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Hi, my name is Mike Loleos. I'm a resident of Rockland. I use the Rockland Library, but I use the Loomis Library much more. I like all the libraries that I've visited. I've visited about four of the county libraries, and uh, they're all unique. Loomis is a gem. I think the others probably are too, but I find Loomis to be my home as a library. I spend about, uh, I spend about two hours a week since 2007. Before that, uh, I was, uh, from the time I've moved here, I've used the library every week uh, to some extent. And uh, what uh, came to my mind was, since I spent so much time there, I would expect that I would recognize other patrons as they come in. I, I know all the staff, they know me by name. And I don't recognize, it's rare when I recognize somebody that comes in during the time I'm using the library. That's two or three hours a week, one to three hours a week, depending on the week. And uh, so I just wanted to, to say there's so many people using the library, it's not always the same people. There are just always new people there and, and it's amazing to me. So libraries are very important and uh, Loomis is a gem. If you close it, it's, it's going to be like, I'm not homeless, but I'm home at the Loomis Library. Thank you. Okay, uh, this, since this is not an action item in the board, as it was uh, conveyed earlier, the board is not taking action on this item today, but rather uh, just receiving a report from the librarian and, and soliciting public input. We're going to go ahead and cut off public input at this point. And um, before I open up for a discussion of the board, uh, just a couple of clarifications that based on statements that were made that I'd like to get. Unfortunately, the lady who asked the question about stopping the erosion and the purchase of the bookmobile, 
Um, she and her daughter had to leave, I guess. But regardless, if we get the uh, staff's response in terms of the priority of stopping the erosion, how what that means, and then whether the bookmobile has already been purchased. Sure. Um, I don't see the. Um, I didn't see in the strategic plan that the um, initiatives have any order. Um, we, when we make decisions budget by budget, since the strategic plan was passed, what we've tried to do is look at all three of them and try to move forward um, simultaneously, helping each initiative move forward. Um, to that end, we consolidated with county IT last year to um, help with our redundancy and our technology issues. Um, reversing the erosion, erosion means that we've lost something. and. Over the course of the time when we were open while other libraries were taking their service reductions, when the economy started to get bad in 2008, we stayed open and kept our service going. And, um, and thus what's happened is we eroded during that time because we weren't putting money back into our library system to move us forward. Um, we were just maintaining a status quo. Um, building uh, capacity, we've um, formed a fund with the Placer Community Foundation. The, um, each uh, Friends of the Library group gave $1,000 for that. An anonymous donation of 1000 came in to support the Bookmobile, which is also one of our branches. And now that fund is um, past $25,000 and has been invested. So we're hoping that that will grow over time. So we, we hit on each initiative um, throughout our budget cycles and whenever we can. Um, one of the important um, signs in my office is pay attention and take advantage. I try to take that to heart. Um, the Bookmobile is a great example of taking advantage. Um, we've developed a great partnership with Air Quality Control. They give us a, they sponsored a $20,000 grant one year so we could buy electronic resources because we wrote the grant saying, well, if people stayed home and checked out eBooks and didn't travel to libraries that it would save emissions and they bought that and they gave us $20,000, which was extremely helpful in um, dipping our toe into the electronic resource um, you know, venue. And then um, with that relationship, we went back the next year and asked them for additional funds, about $20,000 to help fund a new bookmobile. Our bookmobile is almost 30 years old now, and um, we've been putting it together, you know, band-aiding it together. We didn't spend any um, library funds for that bookmobile. It um, comes out of the, um, the fund for public works. Um, we pay into that enterprise fund every year and have been doing that for 30 years, knowing that eventually we would need to purchase a new bookmobile. Okay, thank you. Um, there was a statement that uh, the Loomis um, Library generates a surplus of $15,000 a year. Do you have any comments on that? I don't know where those figures come from. I, I don't see that. Okay. Um, there was the assertion that we are projecting property taxes go up by 7.5%. My recollection of our budget year over year is we are anticipating at this time about a 2 to a 2.5% increase in property tax. So these, again, these budget, uh, the 2014-15 amounts are actually are budgeted numbers. So these are what's in the final budget. Right. What actually ensues is obviously a different amount on both the revenue and the expenditure side. The budget was put together with, with a $4.08 million amount for property taxes, which is made up of more than just the ad valorem portion, right. which is the 5% increase or, or roughly thereabouts that is represented as the property tax increase. Right. It also includes supplemental uh, property taxes. It also includes any uh, distributions from the former redevelopment agency through the successor agency uh, for Placer County uh, related to the dissolution of redevelopment. So all of those components make up that property tax number. Having said that, that $4 million amount will likely grow uh, to, to a different amount, which is why the $427,000 deficit that's projected in the budget we represent it to be about two hundred to two hundred and twenty thousand. So that extra two hundred to two hundred and twenty thousand dollars, a portion of that is related to additional revenue okay. related to property tax. But as as far as on an annual basis, this board making our budgetary projections, the anticipated growth of assessed valuation in the county that we project is closer to two to two and a half percent. Correct. Um, question was raised regarding middle fork funds. Um, I, I know that we've had extensive hearings at the board here about uh, Middle Fork funds. We've had a number of different conversations about the utilization of those funds for infrastructure purposes. Um, uh, those numbers are available, uh, and our, we, do, we review those again every year as a part of our budget. Um, but 
the great assumption that drives those revenues is? It's going to rain. We'll have water. Yeah. Uh, it's an entirely hydroelectric uh, system. And without rain, without a snowpack, uh, the numbers are based on an average of uh, snowpack that we anticipate. And so that's what we any of those projections are obviously going to be affected by what is or is not uh, up above 7,000 feet at this point. Right now, as Supervisor Montgomery can tell you, there is a scant little of it. Um, but those numbers are available publicly to you right now should you want to get those. Mm -hmm. And those were all the items that were raised that I just wanted to clarify. I'll hold any editorial comments until after board members have had a chance to comment. Supervisor Wygant, your light was on first. Uh, sure. Um, and I'll continue with some questions. Um, keeping in mind the action that the board has taken so far, which is essentially to endorse, Mary, your strategic plan. Um, and we're uh, hearing back from that today, and I'm more than happy to have those conversations and try to work with the community to find alternative uh, solutions. But to be successful in doing that, uh, not only are we going to have to have people who are engaged, but we're going to essentially have to agree uh, on some basic platform issues like some of these numbers. So, Kirk, you did a great job of raising some of them. One of the questions that I think you may have already addressed is, I think we were told that actually if it, we were to close the Loomis Library, it would cost us $15,000 per year. So do you have any comment on that? It's my understanding that that explicitly is exactly not the case. That I don't know where those numbers come from. Okay. And um, Supervisor Wygant, with all due respect, the strategic plan is not Mary George's. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is that um, that misperception has has been really difficult for me. And so, as we move forward, if we could just call it the library strategic plan, <laughs> um, there were 500 of your constituents that participated in the in the right. development of that plan, and it took over two years. And a consultant was hired, which, which we received grant funding, you know, to hire her. Um, so, if you we could just not call it my plan, that'd be awesome. <laughs> and and in fact, I think there's a number of people in the audience who were part of that process. Please, please accept my apologies. And so for the rest of today's hearing, let's call it Robert Wygant's critique. <laughs> Maybe I can compensate yeah, a little you bit. You may not want to own it by no the end of the day. Yeah. I'm telling you, we're rudderless. <laughs> So in that same vein, and as it relates to a community-involved process, um, comments were made that somehow this all has been somewhat of a surprise. But for years now, many years, uh, particularly during our budget workshops, you have made presentations as department head relating to the fundamental structural problem in the library budget uh, that reflected the fact that it was not sustainable without uh, subvention from the county general fund and that's why I was kind of driving up those uh, quick calculations that so I think at least we're close enough for this hearing that in 05 and 06 uh, the county general fund created about 19 percent of the overall library budget last year it was about 24 percent if I did uh, calculations correctly quickly here today if we uh, provided about half a million dollars in general fund funding, it would be about 30%. Um, you know, over time, with that lineal type of progression, um, you know, the county general fund could pay for a massive library system, but it would probably be funding library 90% uh, of the cost. And there was a comment made that related to the fact that uh, David made comments this morning about talking about the sound financial health of the county, which is true. Uh, but I would argue enthusiastically that the reason for that is because we've actually dealt with these issues at their core over a long period of time. And the result of it is that we have a healthy budget. And we don't ignore these problems. We don't put easy fixes behind them. We actually have made a lot of tough decisions. This morning we heard another one, which was the homeless issue. Soon we'll be hearing another one of those, which is fire protection. And all of those concerns are near and dear to the hearts of somebody. But in the overall mix of everything, we have to have a whole county budget that makes sense and is sustainable and is in fact healthy. And over the years, we have done that. Um, but it doesn't mean we've got uh, huge amounts of excess money just to slap a fix on, on, on something. Um, what was the first date that you recalled that publicly there was discussion by the board uh, 
uh, or at a board hearing uh, about the potential closure of Loomis and Meadow Vista? Um, I met with each individual um, supervisor with my administrative team to discuss whether the options would be feasible moving forward. And as I met with supervisors that um, represented those districts, I followed their direction on how to announce to their communities the possibility of closure. Right. I don't have the authority, you know, to close a library. And so I only have the authority to recommend that closure. So it worked very closely with, um, with Mr. Bosch and with the board to determine what the appropriate time was to ask to close a library. And I would say that there is never a good time to tell a community that you would like to close their library. My staff and myself have been to three um, MAC meetings in the Metavista community. We went to the town council meeting on March the 10th. We um, went to the Horseshoe Bar Penryn MAC in that same month. We um, sat in the Metavista library for 14 and a half hours and met constituents as they came in. Um, in the evenings, on the weekends, um, in the mornings, to hit various times for folks. So we have tried to be out there in the community to answer the fiscal and the operational questions as best we can. For a long time. Well, for several months. Is that right? Right. So I, and I, again, just mentioned that, uh, again, if we're going to be effect effective in finding uh, some kind of a different model, it, it is going to have to involve good community outreach and input, but we're going to have to be honest uh, about these discussions and straight up. So with that, um, uh, there were several comments made that referred to things like uh, we don't have a 10-year sustainable plan or this kind of strategy that you're proposing or has been proposed and discussed but has, um, as the department head has come forward to the Board of Supervisors, would be in the same place 10 years from now or two years from now. It's my understanding that that's exactly uh, what you and your staff have worked to, to resolve to make sure that we have not only a sustainable financing package but one that really elevates the quality of library services overall to all of the residents that we serve with county library services, which are all of the residents of the county except for uh, the citizens of Roseville and uh, Lincoln who have their own libraries. And, and do you have any further comment? Is, am I misunderstanding? Uh, no, no, and I think it's a, it's a perfect storm is the fact that we um, have recognized this reduction in our revenues at the same time that library service has changed so dramatically. And what we tried to capture with the strategic plan were the trends in librarianship so that we could not only sustain our um, fiscal and operations just for a few years, but that we could try to project out several years, several decades even, about what library service could look like. Um, Joan Fry Williams, who was the consultant on the um, strategic plan, is also what's called a futurist. So she was basing those trends on how, library, how libraries are being used today. And some of those trends are coming to fruition in counties around us. The Library of Things at the Sacramento Public Library, where you can go there now and check out a sewing machine or a, an anvil or you know, whatever you may need. Um, so what we're trying to do is remain vi viable to our communities by um, trying to collect the um, resources to start moving towards um, that modernization of our library system. Okay, and the last uh, comment, then maybe you want to add something to it because I don't remember the details very well, but it'll, it'll reflect my, my closing comments. Um, years ago, uh, when Carlos was city manager of Roseville, and of course the Rockland Library is a county library, but we've always worked since I've been on the board very closely with the city of Rockland looking for grander solutions um, and closely with the friends of the library in, Lock in Rockland who in my view done an extraordinary job of advocating for their position uh, but also helping find solutions the meeting I had with Carlos was that um, in an effort to Rockland had long ago outgrown the old Rockland facility and so Carlos had found a deal on the current facility and he was willing and offered that the city would buy that facility uh, but offer us a dramatically discounted rent, as I recall. One dollar a year. Wow. That's pretty, pretty dramatic. I, see, I don't remember those details. So, um, you know, I, I, in the interim, I'm going to continue to endorse the Robert Wygant uh, County <laughs> <laughs> plan. 
so that it is sustainable and provides us an opportunity to offer the highest level of library services to all of our residents. I'm more than happy to, to have specific conversations with the city of, or town of Loomis, excuse me, um, and any other alternatives that, that might be available. And if you have some kind of a package similar to the way Rockland has helped uh, uh, complement those costs to us, what I'm hearing, and I had a chance to go over the numbers with you, is that, uh, and again, I'm, maybe I'm missing some details, but I'm happy to co have a conversation about those with uh, anyone and everyone, is that the, s the smaller libraries uh, tend to not be as cost effective to manage per unit, per visitor, per hour, per whatever unit you want to pick. And, and uh, the strategy that is in front of the board is to try to look at those kinds of extraordinary cost uh, and and uh, have a sustainable financial package that actually gives us a chance to uplift our level of library services and it includes it can include a lot of partnering and methods by which we can complement um, the county's uh, available resources keeping in mind the huge demand for all of our resources so I'm happy to have those conversations but I think we need to have a real fair honest assessment as to what the an agreement as to the facts and the data um, uh, but in the interim um, I think we're pointed in the right direction and uh, um, pending uh, some alternative proposals that are specific um, which I'm happy to have a conversation about uh, I think we need to keep looking the way we are thanks uh, supervisor Duran yeah just a couple of comments um, as most of you know I'm a practicing attorney and uh, prior to becoming an attorney I was a truck driver and uh, I decided to go back to school and utilize the local libraries to um, uh, get through school and then eventually go to law school. Um, I have a thriving uh, legal practice in, in Roseville and I'm not uh, dealing with these types of issues. So I'm a very, very uh, high and strong supporter of, of the libraries and I was one of the supervisors that uh, said, hey, you know, we need to tap the brakes here um, because it's important to provide the opportunity for uh, the community to to, um, to get involved and to think of think outside the box and to think um, of different ways and different approaches and I am very happy that I see Dave here and I see Miguel um, uh, here at this meeting because it tells me that it has importance of uh, with Loomis but I want to challenge you guys because uh, the feedback that I've gotten back from some of these meetings is that some of your cohorts are basically challenging our numbers and asking what services that uh, the county provides. Um, I will walk with you down this path, but if you're not serious about it, tell me now. Tell me now, because I don't want to waste my time. But I will do what is necessary to beat the bushes to find some type of a solution. But be serious about it, all right? And be respectful about it. Um, second thing is, is, I think there's a lot of opportunity here to, uh, you know, to work together to try to find some type of a solution but if at the end of the day there isn't one you know I'm, I'm I'm with Robert I'm with Robert here that this is the path that we've charted but I'm open to suggestions of timing um, can't last forever but you know I'm, I'm, I'm willing to, to, to put forth whatever I need to do to assist the issue so. uh, Supervisor Holmes uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for your question regarding the uh, growth of the property tax. Um, we know that it is growing. We're thankfully it's kind of flattening out. We're seeing some, but also our expenses are going up quite dramatically. Hence the increase of the uh, Cal Fire contract, which is more than $1.5 million. That's something that we have to uh, address. Uh, the Middle Fork funds, uh, Gary, there are we have uh, meetings every two months on the Middle Fork Finance Authority where those numbers are available. Uh, and if you go to the PCWA website, you can probably see the uh, Supervisor Wigan and I serve on that. Uh, those funds are not gonna be as robust as everybody was talking about five or six years ago. Uh, and so that's something we'll need to address. Uh, Robert, thank you for clarifying about the Rockland Library. I said in some of those meetings with Carlos and uh, that was a very uh, good solution. Uh, actually kind of like a windfall for us that uh, they bought the Rockland actually bought that that building for us um, I I don't have any problem holding off on making a decision 
uh, contingent on our budget uh, discussions when we see what our budget cut numbers come down to. I'm more than willing to work with the community of Loomis. I've showed up there several times um, and working with uh, the town manager and Dave and, and Miguel to see some kind of a way that the town can contribute. Uh, I'm thinking a developer fee. You've got 400 plus homes maybe coming in, probably not right away, but the next five years probably. I think those new residents will take advantage of the library if it's there and the developer fee would be appropriate. And I'd be willing to look at a system-wide uh, parcel tax to see if our library system as a whole uh, can be more robust. Those are just my comments right now. Thank you. Thank you, Super President Montgomery. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who came out today and hung in here for this very, probably much longer than everyone expected meeting. Um, I wanted to start by actually thanking Mary George um, on behalf of the Meadow Vista community because she, she has come to the Meadow Vista Municipal Advisory Council three times um, and uh, uh, each of those times I think became progressively more difficult um, for her but, but I will say that um, you know as soon as she brought the information to me that this potential closure was out there she said you know how do we need to get the information out I, I can't speak for Loomis, because that's not the district I represent, but I can tell you that in Meta Vista, she's been very proactive and really gone absolutely out of her way as her staff to, to make sure that she's communicated directly and one-to-one -one and in public meetings like this with, with the Meta Vista folks. Um, the Meta Vista MAC did uh, give a recommendation that they asked me to bring to the board, understanding that this is not a decision-making meeting for ourselves, but they just wanted to make sure that um, the board was aware that the max recommendation based on input um, that they've had and conversations with folks in Meta Vista is that they do want to keep library service in their community in a bricks and mortar building and that they want to work with us to try to figure out how we do that. And that frankly is the message that I'm hearing from everybody today is how do we work together to try to figure out how we do that. And you know this chart and some of the other charts are really telling. This is a zero-sum game in that we have a certain amount of budget pie to work with. It can only be sliced so many ways and if one department gets a larger slice, somebody else gets a smaller slice. So the question has to become, and I hate this phrase, how do we grow the pie? Um, and, and I think, um, you know, the parcel tax, a number of people have brought that up to me. Um, that would have to be countywide because, as Dave Wheeler pointed out, this is a countywide system. And we have to have a countywide solution. If Michael Lawton is shaking his head no, but it's a countywide system. We need to figure out how to have a countywide solution to the budgetary challenges that I think none of us disagree are actually facing the library system and us at the county. Um, District 5 is, uh, which I'm honored to represent, is extremely fortunate in that we have eight of the libraries in Placer County. I, I happen not to live within, you know, 45 minutes of any of them. So the bookmobile is something that helps service some of the more remote areas in Placer County. So the bookmobile, I think, is an incredible value and something that um, n needs to be recognized not as a silly expenditure, but a critical piece of library infrastructure for those people who can't get to physical libraries. Um, what I've heard tonight again, or tonight, today, we're practically to tonight, um, what I've heard today is, you know, what is the purpose? What is the intent? What is the idea behind libraries? And I think we all are on the same page on that, which is they, need, they are and they need to continue to be community assets. But again, they're community assets that we have to figure out how to pay for, how to fund, how to make more robust, how to not just spend the $500,000 to stop the degradation of our library services, but how to find that larger amount, how to improve them and how to make them more robust and serve the vision that we all want them to, to serve. Um, Robert Wygant's study um, that took two years and had about 500 people participating in that gets to that. Um, I attended a couple of those meetings. I saw a lot of the, the friends at those meetings. And, and to be fair, none of those meetings and the, and, the, and the study itself didn't say we're going to close libraries, but it said we need to take a comprehensive look at how we create a stronger library system. Number of ways to do that, one of which is funding them more. 
we could make that choice here and we could say we're not going to put a million dollars to roads. Believe me, we're going to hear from the people who want better roads in Placer County. So if we're going to work together, um, and I'm totally willing to have that conversation and figure out how we work together, um, we need to have some hard conversations about how we come up with more dollars to fund our libraries because the, um, the numbers that I think Ramona, was that your name? I'm sorry, that, that Ramona came up with, are, they're really important figures. We're on the low end of, of how we fund our libraries per capita. But that's a community choice we're going to have to make. And you know, while I will pay for a parcel tax, I don't know that everyone will. So if that's the decision that the community decides they want to move forward with, you're all going to need to be advocates for this. And not just here at the Board of Supervisors meeting, but out in your own communities and out in other communities. Because it is going to take a countywide vote. Now in Loomis, potentially the town, as a discrete jurisdiction, could take its own vote. But this is a, a, an institutional question for all the libraries within the library system. And we need to come up with a long-term answer if we're going to come up with an answer. And I think uh, Supervisor Duran is correct in saying if we take it out to the public and they don't come back to us with, yes, we value them and we want to pay for them, that's a different message and that's a different discussion that we'll need to have at that point in time. So my feeling is, let's give you a year. Let's give everybody a year to try to figure this out. Um, let's give our board the opportunity to figure out how we can continue to fund the library for the next year. But we're in a time crunch here because that blue arrow is going to continue to go down while we're having that conversation. So I'm asking you to help us make that argument, make that conversation, and make it resonate and figure out how we fund our libraries because they are our priority. So thank you all for coming out. Um, I wish I had a magic wand. But uh, for this and so many other issues, I don't have a magic wand, but together I think we can come up with a solution. Supervisor Holmes, you had something else? Yeah, I just had a comment on that parcel tax discussion. Um, I'm not sure whether Roseville and Lincoln would be part of that because they have their own library systems. Yes. That's, that's something that uh, which should be a Placer County system-wide, library system-wide. But we'd certainly invite them uh, if they wanted to be part of that. So. No, exactly. I just meant, you know, Forest Hill's going to need to vote on yeah, it right. and Emigrant yeah. Gap and all those other places as well. And okay. I just wanted to thank Mary and her staff for uh, the tremendous beating you took. I was there where it took, uh, took some of it. I mean, it wasn't a beating, but you performed yourself very professionally and answered all the questions in a respectful manner. I just want to thank you for that. Just a quick comment yes, on the Grant. broader scheme of any. If you hold one sec, Sir Roger Grant. Folks, I'm, I'm hearing quite a bit of buzzing coming back at us here, so if we could keep it quiet while we just wrap up here, that'd be great. Go ahead. Right. Um, part of any strategy, uh, I think, for funding needs to include advocacy for that share of ERAF coming back. That's, that's going to be vital. And I think that you know, now that the state is on an upturn a little bit, we could probably get some support with other counties to try to go after a piece of that. So I think that should be part of our ledge platform um, as well. So. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm advocating that we move forward uh, legislatively to advocate for a return of some portion of the ERAF that was uh, taken from us a couple years ago now that the state is uh, uh, in, in somewhat of a better position. Um, and that's not just something that we can do from a county perspective, but that's something that we, you know, have a lot of other friend counties that are facing the same issue, and that should be part of our legislative uh, policy. So, thank you. I okay, apologize and, for not speaking into this. <laughs> and just my uh, general comments as we move forward on this item. First of all, um, a lot of time and effort on everybody's part has gone into getting us here. And you've heard a commitment from several members of this board that uh, we do want to continue to work to find solutions. However, let us not assume that service delivery methods need to evolve in all other aspects of government other than libraries. Everybody talks about efficiencies and trying to drive efficiencies in government. Simple fact of the matter is libraries at one point were our primary source for distributing information. Today, it's right here. There was a time when uh, there was actually a business of people 
um, running stores that rented out computers that were connected to the internet uh, on a minute by minute basis. Today the proliferation of the internet made those obsolete. We have more information available at our fingertips than is in any of the libraries that we have. In fact, I found it interesting that each of the speakers that got up and gave statistics gave statistics they found online, not in the library. That being said, libraries do have a functional place. They are community centers, and I agree with that. But that requires the participation of the community. We've learned today that the city of Rockland does contribute to the county's library system. The city of Auburn does contribute to the county's library system. The town of Loomis currently doesn't contribute to the county library system in taxes beyond or in dollars beyond the property taxes that we collect, just like we do in Rockland and Auburn. I would also put forward that within one mile, actually 1.1 mile, because I actually did do the route while I was sitting up here, within 1.1 mile of the Loomis Library, there are three other public libraries. There's Loomis Elementary School, there's Del Oro High School, and there's H. Clark Powers. I was extremely, excuse me, I was extremely disappointed to see the school system send out an email to everybody, I got a copy of it, encouraging folks to show up and protest the Board of Supervisors' decision to close the library. They have three libraries sitting within a mile of our library. Why is the school district not represented in this meeting today? Why is the school district not here talking about how we can share resources and work to keep libraries open for greater hours for the benefit of the entire community? This will, be, this will require everybody's active participation. It will require everybody's cooperation. But we have to be honest about the cost of service delivery. We have to be honest about the county's current fiscal situation and what we're trying to do in everything from the fine gentleman in green that you see sitting in the back to our roads and our sewers. And our service delivery has evolved in most other areas. It will evolve in this area. And so as long as we go forward with that cooperative engagement that has gotten us here, I know you have the commitment from Supervisor Holmes, who represents the Loomis area, Supervisor Montgomery, who represents the Meta Vista area, that they will continue to remain engaged. And we look forward to continuing this conversation, hopefully with some solutions, with this audience and a broader audience, when it comes back to us for action. So thank you very much for your participation on this matter today. And we look forward to hearing back from you folks when it comes back to our board for action. And we're going to go ahead and move on to our department items that we haven't touched on yet. So with that, thank you all. And we'll ask staff to come forward for our next department item. Ladies and gentlemen, we do have two more department head items that we do have to take up prior to us conducting our, concluding our business for the day. So I'd ask if you'd take your conversations outside at this point so we can continue on with the remaining business of the board. All right, we're, we're going to go ahead and continue with the board agenda item, um, department head item seven, administrative services, procurement. This is in regard to a replacement of a patrol vehicle, patrol boat, Lake Tahoe Marine. Good afternoon, Supervisor Euler, Chairman, Chairman Euler, Supervisors. My name is Brett Wood. I'm with the procurement division. And with me today, I have Javier Terrazas with the purchasing division as well as joined by Captain Walsh and Mark Giacomini from the Sheriff's Office. We're here today with you to talk about uh, three action items. One is to approve a budget revision to increase revenues and expenditures in the amount of $470,920 within the Sheriff's Office, 1415 final budget to purchase a replacement boat for the Lake Tahoe Marine Patrol Program with no new net county cost. Approve a purchase order 
to Moose Boats, Inc. of Petaluma, California in the amount of $485,952 for the purchase of an M235 outboard patrol catamaran. And then number three is to authorize the purchasing manager to sign the resulting purchase order and related documents and add the equipment to the master fixed asset list. Uh, today I'd like to turn the time over to Captain Walsh to talk a little bit about the background and need for the equipment. Uh, I can address how we arrived at the procurement we're recommending and then uh, Mr. Giacomini will talk about how we're paying for it. Great. Let's get it as well. Yes. yes. <laughs> so at our last, <clears throat> the last time that I met with this board regarding this topic was on January 20th up in Tahoe. Uh, and I advised this board of our current operations that uh, we have on Lake Tahoe with Marine 6 and the limitations of the 27-year-old boat. <clears throat> a patrol boat, just to recap a little bit on that, a patrol boat on Lake Tahoe is essential for the enforcement of boating laws on the 41% of the lake that is under the jurisdiction of Placer County. We conduct collision investigations, search and rescue operations, and general public safety for our residents and the many visitors to Lake Tahoe. The recreational activity and special events using the waters of Lake Tahoe has continued to expand during the last 27 years and we have exceeded the limitations of the current vessel. The California Department of Boating and Waterways estimates the useful service life of a, of a patrol boat at, 20, at uh, 15 years. Our boat is currently at 27 years. Although the boat has been very well maintained to the best of our abilities, time and exposure <coughs> to the elements as well as water intrusion and the structural integrity of the boat have led us to seek a replacement platform. The direction of the board at that time was the sheriff's was for the sheriff's office to proceed internally and to explore options as far as uh, replacement. So since that time, we've been working with procurement. Uh, we had previously already been looking at different platforms in the event that at some point we would need to replace it. And in so doing, we had identified the Moose boats as an ideal platform moving forward for the next 27 years. The Moose platform offers an ideal uh, solution for our issues in that we have both a size of the hole uh, uh, limitation and then cabin requirements. In order to meet the needs of uh, search and rescue operations, medical aids, as well as general patrol functions, we had looked at a larger cabin, a heated cabin, one that could uh, allow us to put patients within the cabin comfortably in inclement weather while at the same time recognizing that with many of the boat manufacturers, a larger cabin represents a larger hole we have a limitation on the size of the hole. Moose Boats offers us the solution that they build the cabin separately from the hole. Um, in addition to that, uh, Moose Boats located in Petaluma, California, as mentioned by Mr. Uh, Wood, uh, is a local for our purposes, which allows us to keep tabs on the construction of the boat, keeps the funds within the uh, state of California. Moose, offer, uh, Moose manufactures patrol boats for both law enforcement and public safety agencies across the country and uh, military. It's constructed of an aluminum alloy catamaran style hull, which offers a very stable platform in the choppy conditions that we encounter on Lake Tahoe. It has a five-year structural warranty. The hull also has less draft than our current platform. At 22 inches, it allows our boat to navigate in shallower water than the current platform that we're utilizing. That hull design, the catamaran hull design, also makes better use of the deck space for equipment storage and allows us to put more people on the boat if we need to deploy for critical incidents. <clears throat> the boat is uh, normally powered by an inboard jet engine. However, Moose Boats had recently started um, utilizing a twin outboard motor configuration. As it would happen, they had one, a hole that was being built at the time that we began working with procurement for the purposes of getting a monohull originally due to the cost. However, Moose offered us a discount on that uh, catamaran style hull um, with twin outboard motors. The benefit of the outboard motors as opposed to the inboard motors, it allows us to remove the engine in the event that it requires service without having to take the whole boat out of the water. That's just kind of the highlight, the 10,000 foot view. I do have a couple of photos if uh, I didn't bring enough for everybody, but if you want to pass them around, you can see pictures, yes. You can see the design of the boat and how it differs dramatically from what we've utilized in the past. Good afternoon, Mark Jack, from the Sheriff's Office. Um, before we move into questions, we'll touch now on the funding piece um, and what we came up with to, uh, to, to fund the vessel. 
not, as the captain mentioned, not only was this a fantastic deal to get a, a mid-construction boat, um, we worked really close with Brett to get this done. In November of last year, the county received um, unbudgeted one-time allocation of public safety sales tax from the state. Um, we received, as Placer County, we received $636,000 that was unbudgeted in the 1415 um, final budget. The sheriff's portion of that is $471,000, which we're going to utilize to put towards the purchase of this boat. Um, in addition to that, we are saving about, we have about $15,000 of savings and salaries and wages in the Tahoe appropriation. And it's important to, to point out that the public safety sales tax dollars are specifically for frontline law enforcement. And so we, we view this as a great opportunity to use these unbudgeted public safety sales tax dollars from the state to purchase a, a much needed asset up in Lake Tahoe. In addition to that, you'll notice in your board memo that the $471,000 covers just the base hull with, with no engines. And I, everyone kind of gets a crack about that, but we, we have a plan for the engines too. We will be applying for a boating and waterways grant for $82,000. The deadline is April 30th, and so our hope is if we get approval today, we'll get the purchase order cut in the next couple of days, and we'll get our grant application into the state for two engines, a trailer, and some other ancillary equipment. And with that, I'm happy to open, open it up for any, any questions. Hey, one caveat with that, we have been, I, I can't say assured, but we have been told by the state that we will be very, very competitive for the equipment grant if we do get the approval, we have the purchase order with Moose Boats. If we happen to not get the grant, we do have a backup plan. We have rural counties funding in 15, 16 that we'll buy the engines with, and then we'll defer the trailer and the ancillary equipment to, to a later date. So okay. with that, any questions? We're one. Supervisor Graham. Yeah, is there any additional cost in operations above and beyond what it costs to operate the existing boat? So we, we fund our uh, yearly operational uh, costs through a grant from the California Department of Boating and Waterways that pays for the time on the boat. Um, in addition to that, I'm not aware of any other costs beyond that that requires any funds out of the general or the, the sheriff's office budget. Well, I would just add to that, that was also on your consent agenda today, the annual boating and waterways grant. Um, that was the $72,000. Right. Um, we also get boat taxes in addition to that that pay for the, the, the entire marine Operation. patrol program fund is, is covered by that. Yes, sir. So we're just swapping out a boat. That's all we're doing. Right. Yes, sir. Thank you. Supervisor Montgomery. Uh, Mark, perhaps I didn't hear about what's going to happen to the, to the old boat. <laughs> so I'll let the captain answer that. I don't, that what boat was funded through uh, the California Department of Boating and Waterways. They are actually on the title for that boat. The boat does not belong to us. So once we have finished operations with that boat, we pull it out of the water, it will have to be returned to the state of California. So do we plan on retiring that boat, bringing the new boat on? We're not going to operate two boats, in other no, words? No, that boat gets retired. Okay. In fact, my concern is if we pulled that boat out of the water for a full inspection, they would not let us put that boat back into the water, which is one of the concerns that we have. Uh, about the structural integrity of the boat. Okay. It is their boat, so once it comes out of the water and we replace it with a new boat, then it gets returned to them. Okay, my, my concern was just relating to Supervisor Duran's questions about operational costs. I, I don't want to find ourselves in a situation of having to operate two boats. Yeah. One, I think, is adequate, so thank you. Thank you. Any other questions by board members on this item? Uh, seeing none, we'll entertain a motion for the budget revision as well as approving the award of the purchase order to Moose Boats and authorize the purchasing manager to sign the resulting purchase order. Second. We have a motion to run and a second Montgomery. It is a roll call item, please. Sorry. Duran? Yes. Well, yes. Holmes? Yes. Montgomery? Yes. Euler? All right. Thank you very much. And moving on to item eight, Health and Human Services, Adult System of Care. This is a contract amendment with AGES Treatment Centers, a contract cancellation, and a contract amendment for community recovery resources. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I think I can be relatively quick. As you know, substance abuse treatment leads to reduced crime and enhanced public safety. Uh, so we have before you two uh, contract amendments, as was um, said. Uh, both of these organizations are in support of the um, amendments. Um, AGES provides method on maintenance treatment. Um, and that's really solely as a result of um, anticipated and known increased costs for the number of people that have drug medical that are going to be seeking that particular service. 
Uh, the core amendment is a little more, more complicated. There's three reasons. One is for the increased amount of people that we anticipate, um, same as with Aegis. Uh, but the other reason is that um, the core does has, have a separate contract uh, for adolescent treatment um, that uh, we need to add some language to, so we're taking this opportunity to terminate that contract and move the contract into the continuum of care contract with the big core contract. So that moves that over. It's, everything else stays the same. It gives them a little more flexibility, actually, to increase some of the adolescent treatment. And then thirdly, um, this time of year we do move folks, um, we do move dollars from contracts that are underutilizing um, into contracts that are utilizing. And so for AB 109, we're doing that to move some dollars into the core contract. And then in addition, we are also uh, providing some increase for the, using the Mental Health Services Act dollars uh, to have them provide uh, treatment for people with co-occurring issues. Um, none of these contract increases uh, require any uh, county general fund. The dollars identified in the core contract are already in the contract, so there's no increase. And the budget revision is necessary because we need additional spending authority to do this increase. Um, the contracts are for this year and next year. They're all two-year contracts. So with that, I would be happy to answer any questions, but would recommend you take the action described in your um, packet. Any questions by board members? So no questions, we'll entertain a motion. All right, we have a motion and a second. Um, motion home, second. Duran, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Thank you very much. We do have one closed session item. County Council will take us into closed session. Uh, the board will now adjourn to a closed session for a conference with legal counsel on one item of existing litigation.
the, the board had returned from closed session where, with a, from a conference with legal counsel on uh, existing litigation, Garwood's building versus County of Placer. The board heard a report from counsel and authorized the county counsel's office to defend the litigation. That concludes the closed session report. And with that, the Board of Supervisors is adjourned for the April 7th meeting. Thank you.